broken supply chains and surging demand were just some of the factors that have driven food prices to their first record high since the Arab Spring. And that's all before a war between two of the world's biggest food producers. Ukraine is called the breadbasket of Europe, and taken with Russia, the two account for about a quarter of global wheat trade. They produce more than half of the world's sunflower seeds and oil, nearly 20% of the barley. Now throw in rising energy prices, and processing, transporting, even refrigerating food gets more expensive. Plus, fertilizer production is extremely energy intensive. Less fertilizer means lower crop yield, and prices rise even more. The pandemic revealed how complicated and fragile global trade systems are. Global agriculture, perhaps even more so. Unlike metals, for example, food goes bad. And crops take months to grow and are vulnerable to unpredictabilities like the weather. Rising food prices will be felt everywhere, but the poorest countries in the world will be hit the hardest. And as all these factors compound, the real fear is that record high will lead to record high and ultimately to a global food crisis with vast consequence. A lot's happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From businesses most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the ballpark. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. Politics to the world of business. Balance of Power with David Weston brings you news, analysis, and insight from and about politics power players. Balance of Power, weekdays on Bloomberg. So you've got to explain this one to me. What does it mean when the White House says we're watching markets carefully? It means they have a Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. They have I've been in and seen it. Lots of Bloombergs. Lots of Bloomberg. 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 I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means they have a Bloomberg. go through that transformation of the next three years with a very, very strong capital base and leave the transformation also with a very strong capital base. It will become profitable definitely from 2024 onwards. The good Mr. Ulrich Kerner in charge of a Swiss bank under siege. It's Credit Suisse. You know the story if you're part of Global Wall Street. It has been a challenge for years, maybe signals by the acquisition of Donaldson, Lufkin, Jenrette uh, years ago. But the fact is today in crisis. Again, as Lisa and I mentioned earlier, folks, we want to be clear. There is not a run on the bank. This is not like uh, it's a wonderful life or anything like that. But there has been an exit of assets from their wealth management that has shocked the financial world this morning, including our Marion Halftermeyer in Zurich. And we welcome her today. Marion, thank you so much for taking time out from your reporting. Will more assets exit from wealth management? That is a million dollar question, Tom Keen. Um, listen, everyone's watching that, everyone's concerned about that. I think. <laughs> The thing we have to think about for this quarter is that it was a unique scenario. There was a lot of anticipation for how are they going to like restructure this bank? How are they going to save the bank um, from the demise everyone was speculating about? So you mm -hmm. had this situation in early October where you had this sort of mean stock situation where a lot of speculation was happening and that sent people into a panic. Right. And so a lot of wealthy clients pulled assets and that's the number we're seeing come out today. We've got the equity uh, moments ago, like last 45 minutes, we've got the approval for a 4 billion Swiss franc equity raise. But the question to me, and you've reported this and everyone else has as well, they have breached entry level or local level regulatory requirements. Is this the day where the Swiss government or some authority steps in to assist Credit Suisse forward? No, we're not at that point at this point. The, the breaches they've made are at different smaller entity levels. And so from an overall regulatory perspective, they've 
they've maintained the levels that are are supposed to keep regulators comfortable. And on top of that, you know, with the, the capital raise that was approved today, we are seeing a strong bank. They're also issuing more debt, so they don't have trouble financing themselves. Um, the liquidity ratios that were breached on those specific entities were really related to like the, the assets that were being pulled out of those different entities. Marianne, what is the profile of the new Credit Suisse once it has raised, if they do fully approve uh, the $4 billion capital raise, if they do uh, continue with their plan to cut about 9,000 positions and in the face of some departures of senior executives? Yeah, the, pro the profile of the bank, is, it's its going to be interesting to see what we what we end up with in 2024 when they go through the bulk of the restructuring. But we're looking at a, a bank that wanted to really become a wealth manager and it's sort of following the same path as UBS did post-financial crisis where they're downsizing the investment bank quite significantly. You know, we have the spinoff of First Boston, the revival of that boutique. Um, we have the sale of certain parts of the business like the securitized product group to Apollo. Um, and then in wealth, they really wanted to beef that up. Now, the key difference here is that for them, they don't have the U.S., which the U which UBS can rely on. They have to focus on Asia and other emerging markets, which can be a little bit more volatile. And in particular, that's what we're seeing with the reaction of all these asset outflows. So hopefully, I mean, that's what they want, is they want to be a strong wealth manager and look like a strong private bank, um, you know, with hopefully a couple trillion dollars of assets. But right now... They're, they're having a hard time breaching the $1 trillion level at this point. Meanwhile, one of the big investors that's come in to rescue them is the Saudi National Bank. How much controversy mm -hmm. is there around where some of the investments are coming from as they try to raise money? The Credit Suisse has always had strong investors from coming from the Middle East. The Qataris and the Saudis have long held positions in Credit Suisse. So from a... Nuna's perspective, they've always been involved. From a from a Swiss geopolitical perspective, there have been some concerns raised. Um, but I think Credit Suisse sees it as, you know, we have diverse backing. We don't just have Middle East investors. And there will be other investors coming in oh, for different on. parts of the business. Mary, Mary, come on. Saudi Arabia beat Argentina in football. Is this the day where, where the Middle East beats the Swiss in Swiss banking. I've got on the screen 12% Kingdom of Saudi Arabia. Qatar, when they're not watching football, has a 5% position as well. At what point does the Middle East take over this venerable Swiss bank? That's a, that's a question we'll, we'll have to see. I don't think that, you know, from a, a nationalistic perspective, I doubt the Swiss regulators would be interested in letting... A, a Swiss bank with such Swiss right. roots be completely controlled by, you know, a foreign a foreign entity. Um, I think for most banks in most national countries would not want their national banking champion to be owned by someone else. So I think we're far away from that fully. Um, but, you know, they, they've, they've always relied on Middle Eastern investors, and I think that they will continue to see them as strong investors in their bank. Drama in Zurich. Marion Haltermeyer, have a great Thanksgiving. Thanksgiving, Marion, is where the bird is cooked in America and the pilgrims came over. I don't, they don't do, I've been over there for Thanksgiving, actually. What, the pilgrims? No, not the pilgrims. I've been in Zurich for Thanksgiving. Oh, it's just, it's I wasn't sure which one you were talking Rossi, about. <laughs> Rossi Lip yeah. is not serving um, turkey. Marion Haltermeyer, there's really on top of the story with Steve Ahrens in, in Frankfurt as well. And I'm sorry, I go back to the ratios for folks, and you do, you do compare. The book value of Credit Suisse now is 0 0.22 on the Bloomberg screen. It's, and it's that's like, like, Is it a going concern? And we get the confidence there from Marion on what Zurich is doing in a $4 billion dilutive equity raise as well. Okay, great. But what do wealth management clients do? This becomes a real Why? problem, especially given the fact Why that this was... Why put up with right, aesthetic? And that's, a lot of them are not. The question is, can they get the rest to stay, and can they build a franchise around it? I do think the idea of casting some sunlight on the entire market is a really good one, and it can mean that so companies that are healthy do better because they do <clears throat> capitalize on inflation and the fact that there's just is more cash running around, and those that are struggling uh, struggle right. even more because there definitely is a weeding out of the haves and the have-nots in terms of strength. Well, the urgency here on the beleaguered Swiss bank, we really didn't do a data check, and we've got one statistic today in the Bramo world, which is critical, further curve inversion. The vanilla spread down to negative 78 basis points. The two-year yield is 0.78%. 
higher than the 10-year yield. I went back and looked on the chart. We're back to autumn of 1981. That's right. Mr. Powell is back to Mr. Volcker's time. Well, this is the first time since 1981 that we have seen the central bank hike rates to the same kind of degree, the same kind of pace. So this is exactly what we saw in terms of the pace of rate hikes. So it's not that surprising, perhaps, that the curve inversion uh, is the, what it is. I guess the issue that I have, and this goes to what John Stoltzfus started the show on, there is this belief that the Fed is not going to torpedo the economy, that there is going to be a soft landing. And that's what's baked into a lot of prices. That's what's baked into a lot of the optimism that you're hearing about the second half of 2023. That needs to be seen, but that is right now one of the consensus is heading into 2023. And now we go mainstream, the Thanksgiving obligatory what's it going to cost chart. I saw in the zeitgeist yesterday, restaurants are cheaper than home. If you're at home, and you're looking at sweet potatoes. I mean, it's, are you looking at sweet potatoes? Sweet potatoes I'm are the cheapest. I'm looking at sweet potatoes. It's an outrage. Well, I mean, come on, up 11% and that's like nothing. No, the stuffing is the real, uh, is the real kicker. And that's 69%. Not stuffing I no. I, that's not <laughs> stuffing on radio. That's not the stuffing I cook. What do you cook? Uh, it's terrible. It's, un it's unedible. <laughs> When you think of cutting edge technology at sea, you might be thinking of stuff like this. But there's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90% of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3% of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? the world like Bloomberg. My team thinks 2023, we avoid a recession. I'm a little more skeptical about that. China and the U.S. both do not want to see nuclear force on the European continent. The regulators here in the Bahamas are ongoing with their investigation into FTX. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks 24 hours a day, Bloomberg, your global business authority shed light on dark matter you will make aging optional because when you subscribe to bloomberg you won't just get news you will get 
get insight into limitless possibilities. Before you change the world, Bloomberg. Bloomberg surveillance and news flow is so extraordinary today, particularly out of Zurich, Switzerland, with Credit Suisse, that we barely had the lightness and the touch of a magisterial Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Lisa and I, uh, we're, we're dining together, the families. We decided both of our families are so miserable that we might as well <laughs> get together and exponentially compound the miserableness. We're going to have Top Chef with the stuffing and see who does it worse. I think Swanson is in order. The Swanson <laughs> yes. TV dinners is what the King House is Amen. having uh, as well. Actually, I, I saw a Flav City on YouTube giving a rave review to Swanson broth. Well, we'll Rage have to check it out. I think that, that might be uh, my homemade uh, experimentation. Yeah, we will see. But we're trying to get into the Thanksgiving mood, and it's tough with the news flow. It's been extraordinary. In Zurich, we're looking at China, serious protests uh, at an Apple manufacturer, Foxcom, and also the BitDog SAG. I believe is Shanali Amy scheduled to be with us later? Did we talk to her people? Yeah, we is. talked to Shanali's people, and she's going to be with us in the 8 o'clock hour for an update. Right now, one of the other stories out there is the ping pong ball known as oil. Jeffrey Curry provides leadership at Goldman Sachs, and I can only think of the great Adam Siminski at Deutsche Bank years ago. Here's a guy who actually goes into the Excel spreadsheets of figuring out supply and demand. Jeff Curry, what do your Goldman Sachs Excel spreadsheets say about oil price next year based off the mystery of global demand? Well, we're definitely bullish come next spring, but what happens between now and next spring, that path is highly uncertain. You have China COVID cases surging, so you're getting forced lockdowns that were not planned, uh, which is impacting demand up to about 1.2 million barrels per day. Coincidentally, the same size as the OPEC cut. So, you know, I think that's important development there. First time ever OPEC ever cut in anticipation of a demand loss. And then you have the G7 price cap, which just, they keep rolling the dial and it gets milder and milder every day. You know, it's, you know, lease enforceable <clears throat> through shipping insurance. And then you also have the cap coming out at 65, right. 70, well above the 60 that really put the clamp on them. Let's go back to your Chicago microeconomics. What is the elasticity or responsiveness of demand if China wakes up and moves forward and comes out of COVID? How rapidly will that demand pick up when and if? Well, I mean, that's why, you know, we're sticking to our guns of $115 price target for next year, because when they do come out, um, they're going to put a lot of pressure, not only on oil, but the entire commodity complex. Um, and you can think about, you know, 2022 as really being in an environment in which the second largest economy in the world, the largest c commodity consumer in the world was hibernating. So I think you're absolutely spot on. It's a game changer. Now, their base case is that, hey, they're making the preparations today to reopen into Q. But what did we learn in Hong Kong and Taiwan is that eventually it spirals out of control. The cases get, you know, go up too quickly, and then you get a forced reopening. Right. And I think there's a lot of fear of that happening right now. One of the great realities is you pull an all-nighter at the University of Chicago, McCurry teaching micro at Chicago years ago. You do that at Ed DeBevix. Lisa Bram was very familiar with the retro diner in Chicago. So the la the, the last from Chicago greets her colleague. All right, no need to, to sort of relive those moments ahead of Thanksgiving. Jeff, I am wondering, though, when you you talk about the supply to demand dynamic and demand picking up with China. On the supply side, how much of Russia's oil has actually been taken off the market given the refineries in India and the exports over to Europe? I, I mean, it's relatively small. It's somewhere in that, you know, three to 400,000 barrels per day. You know, our, our expectations, it grows modestly uh, as the sanctions begin to take place and you have frictions and other issues involved. Um, but, you know, it's nowhere near as large as what people anticipated. But the offset on that is the investment across the space is far less than what people anticipated. Look at drilling in the U.S. Expectations of U.S. shale have been ratcheting down. Decline rates in non-OPEC-X U.S. beginning to set in. So 
the supply problem or the underinvestment thesis, what we call the revenge of the old economy, is actually much stronger than we thought six months, a year ago. And again, it's not just an oil story, it's everything in the commodity space. This is really important, Jeff, because a lot of people think that we've already seen the supply shock. We've already seen so many barrels taken off the market because of the sanctions on Russia. What you're saying is that's not true, that we have yet to see the true supply constraints that have come from a lack of investment in the shale patch, a lack of investment by oil majors around the world, and now potentially some sort of disruption with Russia if they don't comply with the price caps being imposed by G7 allies. Is that your idea? When will it kick in, the supply constraints that you predict? This is not a, you know, a tactical trading view. I mean, two years ago, in October of 2020, we called for a commodity super cycle, and we still stand by that view. And a commodity super cycle is not an upward trend in prices. It's spike after spike after spike. And this is going to go on and on until we have adequate investment to be able to grow supply. You need to grow um, hydrocarbons and until you have enough of green energy to be able to meet global demand. Right now, 81% of global energy still comes from hydrocarbons. You can't go to zero there and expect the other 20% to carry you. It's gotta be an energy transition and we need that investment. And then to do the green investment, you need the metals. You need the copper, the alley, the nickel, lithium, cobalt, silver. You need all of those minerals to be able to invest in the green capex to be able to solve the, the long run decarbonization problem. So this is not a near term tactical view. We just came off the back of one of the spikes that was well underway before, um, before the events in Russia. And we'll probably see another spike in 2023 as China begins to, to reopen. But in terms of solving this problem, it requires large scale capital investment and the tunes of trillions of dollars and we're not even close back we haven't even scratched the surface yet although by the way uh, good. the one point i want to say is this cycle is no different than the ones that we saw in the 70s and 2000s it's the same kind of commodity super cycle um and what actually i want to make a point yeah what preceded the 70s the nifty 50 new economy what preceded the 2000s? It was the dot-com boom. What preceded this one? The fang boom. That's what we call the revenge of the old economy. New economy takes all the capital from the old economy, starves it of the investment, it needs to grow the supply base, um, which then shifts you into this super cycle environment. On the flip side, uh, what do you say is the revenge of the supply demand dynamic that when you hit $123, $125 a barrel on WTI, demand destruction really comes into play? And we learned that over the past couple of months. How much does that cap where oil prices could go? Well, it depends on where the dollar is trading. Um, you know, obviously, in a really strong dollar environment, you know, that the prices that many countries around the world experienced were all-time highs. While in the U.S., in a real term, the all-time high is somewhere around 190 back in 2008, um, and we reached 130. It wasn't even close, but for Europe, pound sterling, Japanese yen, and many of these other currencies around the world, they experience all-time high prices. So, um, mm -hmm. you know, that to answer that question, yeah. you end up having to ask, where is the dollar trading? Now, I think the key view here in, in 2023 is, you know, you've seen a big run up in the dollar. As we see growth start to materialize in China and other parts of the world, we would expect the dollar to begin right. to taper off, and then you could open it up more for dollar-denominated commodities. But the big event in 2022 was not the fundamental side of the commodities, but it was the dollar. Hey, Jeff, I want to jump to the Chinese wall here, and I want to go from Jeffrey Curry out to Neil Mehta. You've got, as any other firm has, a sell side looking at individual companies. How do you link your world and these constraints that lead to a higher Brent crude barrel over to their world, which is single stock selection, like his call, stunning call on ExxonMobil? Um, you know, when you look at the uh, way the equity's been trading, they've been looking through this yes, noise yes. In, the, in the commodity price because. They're beginning to see that long-term story. And by the way, Exxon versus Microsoft exemplifies this revenge of the old economy story. You know, Tom, you've been doing this as long as I have. How many times have you seen Microsoft, the largest company in the world, and how many times have you seen Exxon, the largest company in right. the world? And you go back to 2000, Microsoft on top, Exxon nowhere right. to be found. 
<laughs> and then you you didn't invest in oil, and then you had that super cycle, 2010, yeah. Exxon on top, Microsoft on the bottom, Jeff, and reverse, in reverse. I've got eight it's, other questions, but we don't have time for it. Jeffrey Curry, thank you so much, with Goldman right. Sachs there, with a view on oil, and it's something we've heard, folks. And what I will say, I'm not going to throw the charts up right now because it's a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. Is it, it, We only have like four people in today, right? Everybody <laughs> else is off. We're Chuck Banner's in. off, Amy's off. And can I just tell you that that was actually a fascinating conversation and the idea that we yeah, haven't the really you seen. Have. Oh, that's, that's not okay. true. China's really yeah. interesting, this question of where that dynamic comes from, what the price caps are actually going to do in Europe. But more importantly, have we actually seen supply right. constrained by what's happened in Russia? The answer is not mm. yet. And that, right. to me, is salient. I'm not going to give you buy, hold, sell, but I'm going to tell you, as Mr. Curry said, as Dr. Curry said, it is simple. These oil stocks have not pulled back on the move from 120 down to 90. They have, it, it, look at the charts, yeah. folks, get them out. I don't have a chart here today, it's Thanksgiving. I'd have a chart <laughs> next Monday. I'll, I'll tell you, I'll pull up the chart. But you're absolutely right, but when you talk to investors, it's the same story. They all say they're still bullish on commodities. They're still bullish on oil. They're still bullish in this idea that the real economy requires more investment and is gonna do well in an inflationary cycle. And it has <clears> defied <throat> what you've seen. Yeah, Exxon near all time highs. I mean, this whole question here of how long can they keep rallying in the face of weaker energy prices seems like quite a bit. Is this exciting? Morocco, my eyes are failing me. They're in the 82nd minute. Morocco, Croatia. There's a lot of 0-0 zero, zero games in the World Cup. I mean, it's like the Simpsons. <laughs> I, think I, I mean, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm just celebrating the Saudi Arabian National Kick National the ball holiday. from farther out. That's what I tell Pharaoh. Did you hear Do that you? Lionel Messi is representing Saudi Arabia in some promotional kind of uh, cool. football thing, which is interesting because he just lost to them in the World Cup. So That's, is that you're awkward? You're killing it. Good? Your depth of knowledge is yeah, shocking. Yeah, it's just absolutely Germany, shocking. Germany, Japan. Germany, Japan, what do you think? I think that it's going to happen. I don't have any insight that whatsoever. Long from Frankfurt. That's <laughs> there we what go. I know. Good Thank morning. you. Real insight. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word. I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman is also dead, although police aren't sure how he died. The disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange FTX has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman-Fried outlined what he called a crash in the collateral from 60 billion to 9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. It's a major blow to Donald Trump. The Supreme Court has cleared the way for a House committee to get six years of the former president's tax returns. It's a resounding triumph for Democrats after a three-year battle. Still, they have only a few weeks left to review the returns before Republicans take control of the House. Shares of Manchester United are higher in U.S. pre-market as its American owners consider selling the English football team. The Glazer family is working on a partial sale of the club or investments, including the stadium and infrastructure redevelopment. Now, the news comes after the team announced its parting ways with Cristiano Ronaldo after he publicly criticized the owners, manager, and many of his own United teammates. Ronaldo is playing in the World Cup with Portugal. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
brainchild of Apollo CEO Mark Rowan. In January, Apollo closed its $11 billion all-stock merger with Athene Holding. It had already owned 35% of the insurer. Here's what Apollo gets out of the deal. Assets under management. Apollo expects them to double to about a trillion dollars by 2026. Much of that projected growth will come from the merger. And those assets are especially attractive to Apollo. Insurance companies typically go after much more modest returns than buyout investors. That will give Apollo more options for investing the cash. Athene is a steady provider of fee income. It has grown into one of the nation's biggest holders of fixed annuities, those retirement savings products favored by risk-adverse customers. The merger will also allow Apollo to simplify its governance. It gave up its dual-class share structure and adopted a one-share, one-vote plan. The hope is that will eventually lead to Apollo's inclusion in the S&P 500. of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution coupled with the speed of the digital revolution. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Nutrigenomics and precision nutrition is one of those rare scientific fields that overlaps with the Instagram-friendly wellness industry. There is a lot of interest in this idea of personalized nutrition and especially how accessible it is to the public. You can go on Google and type personalized nutrition or diet and genes, and you will find dozens of different companies that offer this nutrition precision tests. One of those companies is Routine. Routine claims that their personalized tests stemming from sciences like nutrigenomics make their supplements different. But even with the claims from Routine, as well as dozens of other personalized nutrition companies, the science still has a long way to go. Choppy mark it into 23, but we do think on the other side, say second quarter, third quarter of next year, we're going to be buyers of equities. We're going to reset here in the United States. We'll lead the way, but it's a chop and a churn as we go through the central bank tightening, pandemic in China, and recession, energy related in Europe. As John Stolfus earlier, Joseph Quinlan, he is at Merrill in Bank of America Private Bank, and it is always good to speak to these people that have seen a few cycles. Seen a few moments, Joe Quinlan with some good perspective there um, yesterday. Uh, sleepy Wednesday, if you're just tuning in, guess what? It's not a sleepy Wednesday into Thanksgiving. I'm sorry, we've got protests at Apple Manufacturing uh, in uh, China. We'll get to that in a bit. We've been covering Credit Suisse with stunning withdrawals from their wealth management. It is not a run in the bank, but the stock drifts below four Swiss francs uh, per share. Stunning uh, there as well. And also Jeff Curry here in the conundrum of oil. Now we talk about the great readjust. We do this with data. I'm sorry, Amy, let me do the data. Futures up five, Dow futures up 21. Dollar churning today. It's a Wednesday churn. Bond market giving me no live. Only Abramowitz understands. What economic data matters today, Lisa? Is the University like of Michigan thing? confidence data, Michigan confidence. the initial okay. jobless right. claims, durable goods orders. Is every Fed speaker speaking? N well, no, mm -hmm. and we've got them uh, probably hibernating ahead of the uh, Thanksgiving break, but we are also yeah. getting PMIs in the U.S. following the PMIs that we got in Europe to see whether that potentially the yeah. manufacturing and service sectors also did better than bad. I think Jerome Powell, they, they don't cook turkey, they cook eagle. At the I think that's endangered. I think that that's actually... That's a joke I, from Stan Freeberg <laughs> from 50 years ago. Well, clearly I'm on it. You, you know, you cook the wrong bird. You know, they were supposed to cook the eagle, but they cooked the turkey. 
Is that enough Thanksgiving lore for I'm, you? I'm killing. I'm if killing Pharaoh it. was here, he wouldn't put up with that. <laughs> you don't have to put up with that. How does he either. get out of it? Can you give me some tips? I'm going to get out of it by going to Jennifer McKeon. She's just wonderful. She's at a wonderful shop, Capital Economics. Think of them like Axios. Axios came out of media day one. Uh, Jim and Mike were rocking it. Same with Capital Economics. Day one, they published, and everybody took them seriously as they should. Jennifer, you are readjusting in the next year. You bring down the so-called terminal rate. You're ratcheting down your interest rate gas into March of next year. Discuss that. Yeah, for, for the UK, we, we've just reduced our forecast. We had a relatively high peak um, of 5%, and that was partly following the mini-budget, the fiscal stimulus that we saw coming at, at that time. We've just revised that peak down to 4.5% um, next year. Why? Partly, uh, partly because of that fiscal stimulus not <laughs> coming and, in fact, turning to tightening, albeit, albeit a bit later on. Partly also because we're seeing some signs that perhaps the labour market isn't quite as tight at, as it was. There are some signs in um, surveys of wage negotiations of a bit of a let up. Uh, so we're not quite right. as worried about the inflation. Can picture. you take it over globally? Can you look at a, a misguess here of a higher terminal rate will be off the mark next year? Yeah, well, we thought for a long time that um, the, the U.S. terminal rate will be a bit lower than is priced in, into markets. We have a terminal rate of um, four, of four seven five to five um, there. Um, I, I think in the U.S. we're seeing much clearer evidence of price pressures <coughs> easing up, and the, the U.K. seems to be following suit a little bit in, in that regard. So, uh, labour market's not as tight as it was. There are signs in um, some of the PPI elements that U.S. consumer price inflation is going to come down further. So, so we, we're pretty confident that the peak isn't too far off in the U.S., despite the fact that officials still sounding hawkish. Jennifer, I, I got to say, I got I to gotta kind of bother Tom here because he's raising questions about what we're cooking and that we might cook eagle, which is an endangered <laughs> species, and then, uh, you know, catching me um, off guard. So I will catch you off guard and say, at this point, is the better than bad news in Europe very bad news for what the ECB has to do for ECB officials to come out and hike more than people previously expected in the face of perhaps uh, better, stronger economic output? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I draw limited encouragement from, from the recent European data. Industrial production has been a bit more resilient, um, retail sales too. Some of that's temporary factors. There are some statistical quirks in the Irish data that have been driving up Eurozone industrial production. And also, I think there's simply a lag before, remember the ECB has not been hiking rates for long, there's going to be a lag before the, the effects of the tightening of financial conditions start to come through. Also, the surveys, the, the PMIs we had this morning offered a, a, a little bit bit of relief, a slight uptick, but they're still pointing to falls in, in Eurozone GDP. So I think we are still heading into a recession. There's less evidence in the Eurozone of a let up in price pressures. So I think the ECB is going to need to continue um, hiking. So it, it is generally a pretty, pretty bad picture um, from the Eurozone's perspective. Let's be optimistic for a second. Let's say China reopens, supply chains are normalized. How much of a boon does that give to Europe with both potentially lower uh, supply chain pressures and higher economic activity. Yeah, that's a good point. I'm, I'm not sure it does give a, a massive boost, although during China's lockdowns, it's made huge efforts to keep to keep ports open, to keep industrial production going. So the implications for global supply chains haven't been as, as large as you might expect. Of course, with virus numbers still picking up in, in China, I think 80 cities now affected. It's, it's looking as bad as, as the first wave um, of the virus. So it seems very unlikely really now that we're going to see the, the reopening that people were hoping for ju just a couple of weeks ago. I, I look, Jennifer, just very quickly here. The turmoil is centered on a stunning headline, one of the great headlines of Bloomberg this year. The governor of the Bank of England modeling a two-year recession. How does he extricate himself from that? Does he amend that into next year? Um, well, yeah, it's a, it's, yes, if the data starts to look um, persistently better, but uh, but I think on the, on the UK front, 
to um, retail sales, although they, they rose a little bit in the in the latest data, they, they've not um, reversed the previous falls, and I think there's more there's more to come. So I think probably um, Andrew Bailey is right to expect a, a fairly right. deep recession in the UK. We're expecting about a two percent peak to trough fall, which would be mm -hmm. which would be quite weak. But of, of course, if the data continue to surprise on the upside, then he there can recalibrate go. that, and it would be well received. Optimism we need on a Wednesday. Thank you, Jennifer. For McEwing so much at Capital um, Economics. I think we got to go into the Thanksgiving vamp. I'm looking over at our friends at Fox, and they're doing Thanksgiving cocktails. You <laughs> You're know, jealous. We can't top that. <laughs> and this is but where Tom forget about Thanksgiving cocktails. Let's talk about the inflation that's out there. And I, I'll be honest, I don't think this is funny because it speaks to what's in our grocery stores, it's absolutely stunning, Lisa. Well, and it speaks to this idea of challenge, of difficulty, of souring sentiment, of what we might see at 10 a.m. today. It doesn't feel good when you're paying 69% more for stuffing mix, especially when I cook it. This, this goes on after Thanksgiving, not because of food costs, as we heard from Kona Hake yesterday, but because of petroleum costs, can you imagine Jeff Curry's view? What that's going to do to the grocery store? Well, yeah, I'm curious what that means to for, for sort of growth, given the concern that he doesn't see this necessarily crimping demand if you do have a weaker <clears throat> dollar. I do think, though, on a more positive note, and I can't believe I'm the one doing this, people are getting together, which is actually oh, awesome. God, and so even just, with oh, oil prices, no, come on, it's nice. I mean, I'm not, but I think it's really nice that people are prioritizing. Yeah. Uh, you know, yeah, afterthought, afterthought said, can I get Shake Shack seamless? Can we get, you know, get Shake Shack? That's a bargain. Is it, is it to go? go? I said, yeah, we're going to save, yeah, that, save That's the keen, uh, keen Thanksgiving. Stay with us. Troy Gajewski, he knows how to cook the bird. This is Bloomberg. Good morning. <laughs> standing presence here in, in Houston for the past, I would say, 20-some years since the compact merger. We bought a piece of land, we started building this building. And um, in doing so, we had to also recalibrate how we were building it because the pandemic hit us. And we thought about recreating a work environment that is very, very different, that is catered for this new structural way of working, which we call Edge to Office, where people don't always come to the office to work, can work remotely from their homes, their edges, but have to come back to the office for specific reasons, such as uh, team meetings, customer meetings, and general collaboration. With regards to the hybrid work model, do you see that some, as, as something that will persist longer term when the pandemic is long gone? Yes, no question, this will persist. And I think we are witnessing right now a societal change in the way we work. You're no longer going to measure productivity in the same way as in the past. You're going to be focusing on outputs. Never mind what people do in their private times. It doesn't really matter to a company as long as the output is there. HPE launched its Edge to Office hybrid work initiative in the fall of 2020. The new campus is designed with that flexible model in mind. Balance of Power with David Weston brings you news, analysis, and insight from and about politics power players. Balance of Power, weekdays on Bloomberg. Power. Policy. Politics. 
From the White House to the Hill, Bloomberg covers the leaders in legislation. That was really a tectonic shift for this White House. The theory of this bill, as I understand it, is there'll be a multiplier effect. How did Democrats mobilize specifically younger voters? Bringing you the political news you need to know. The president has made it very clear that this is a significant focus. For the intersection of Wall Street and Washington, nobody covers politics like Bloomberg. really well telegraphed bear market and it's been very orderly so far. The economy is probably going to be flat next year and that incorporates a couple of quarters of recession. We're looking at a recession here in the United States, shallow. Europe I think is already in recession and China's flatlining. What matters right now is when we're going to have inflation peaking and coming down steadily. It's pretty clear that goods prices are starting to normalize but the market is also hoping that services prices will also normalize. If that's not the case, it's going to be a big problem. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance on Wednesday before Thanksgiving when the nation travels. We welcome all of you coast to coast on radio and television. Jonathan Farrow, off for the holiday. What is that? Does he celebrate Thanksgiving? We could ask him when he gets back. When he gets back There's and scheduled something. I don't know. You know, Morocco played Croatia. I wasn't following it. And there's all this laughter except it's not a funny day. It's a really serious news flow day. And let us begin not with a protest in China and a current scheduled to join us, not with BitDog Shanali Basic with an update, but we're going to get right to it this morning. Futures up five and Credit Suisse doesn't matter in Zurich. They are in crisis. They have reported that they are seeing withdrawals from their international wealth management unit, which was the stalwart, was the profit maker. 10% of the assets out uh, going out in the past few months. How much is this a precursor to a huge reshift that we've seen them kind of telegraph that could actually regain uh, investor confidence. Down 24% from the October glow and they breached through four Swiss francs per share. That is a stunning comment. And then following on just before we went to air, reported by Marion Haftermeyer in the Swiss uh, press, they have approval to go out and find $4 billion dollars to dilute the present shareholders even further. This feels like it's been a slow burn until it wasn't slow anymore. This yeah, feels like, like it was sort of, uh, exactly. I mean, it feels like there's been constant struggles, constant mishaps, constant, uh, you know, pain in the face of some of the cannibalization of their business from American oh. banks. And all of a sudden now it's, you know, make it or break it kind of uh, kind of plans. They've got to make uh, their investors feel good about it. Thanks for listening. Peter in Connecticut agrees with Bramo saying, yes, it was a slow burn. Thank you for emailing that in, uh, Peter. Good to see that uh, this morning. I mean, they got to do something. But the next question is, what do you do if at the margin, if you had 24 large, I mean, think Pharaoh. I mean, you know, Pharaoh money. If you had Pharaoh money in Credit Suisse, what would you do at the margin today? What would be the decision tree given 14 other opportunities in wealth management? Well, I don't that? get it. Oh, yeah. John just called in. He's saying that that's you, and he doesn't have any stake whatsoever in Credit Suisse. Just wanted to clarify that. Thank there you. is this point, though, right <laughs> now of what do investors want to see? Who is left? right? Saudi right. Arabian Wealth Management Fund. I want to raise something else, Tom. Please. We've been talking all morning about how much more expensive Thanksgiving dinner is. Huge controversy. They, uh, The Farm Bureau putting out that the price of Thanksgiving dinner is going to be 20% more. The Biden administration's U.S. Department of Agriculture is saying it's only going to be 1% more, and that that's sensational as headlines. So just want to put that out there as sort of a correction. There are no Democrats at whole paycheck. That's what I would say. I, you've got to be kidding me. I, I'm with the Farm Bureau. I'm going through the store looking at basic stuff. You know, I only shop like once every three months, but basic stuff or something esoteric, some of this gluten-free bologna. you got to be kidding me. It's all to the moon. <laughs> it's true. But how much does this really uh, highlight the tenuous moment that we're in where, on one hand, you can pick out, you can cherry pick where inflation is absolutely skyrocketing in other places. You can find right. instances in which it's not, depending on where you shop and people are migrating to those places. 
We'll have to see. What else do you see this morning? The data check here. We got to do a brief here. Futures up four. Dow futures up 18. I don't have much going on on a Wednesday, except seriously, Credit Suisse south of four. Swiss franc per share. Lisa? What I'm watching today is a whole host of data. It is the data dump before Thanksgiving, consolidating three days into one. Uh, 8.30 a.m., we get initial jobless claims, durable goods orders, <coughs> and 9.45 S&P Global U.S. Manufacturing and Services PMIs. That follows on to what we got over in Europe. And then at 10 a.m., we get the University of Michigan sentiment for for November, as well as some new home sales for October. I'm very curious about consumer sentiment in light of the inflation that we're seeing, in light of some of the easing pressures in some areas while still seeing rents continuing to go up. Curious about how that plays out today. A group of seven nations are aiming to announce a price cap level for Russian oil. I don't really understand how exactly this is going to be only implemented. Gloss, only Javier. <laughs> I'm just, uh, but we're understanding it's somewhere between 60 and $70. Russia mm. says it won't comply. The rest of the world says, yeah, you will. We'll find out more, and it's supposed to be enforced on December 5th. We shall see. 2 p.m., FOMC meeting minutes from the November 2nd meeting, this to me will be the big event of the day. How much is there a fissure among some of the consensus on the FOMC, the Federal Open Market Committee? How much do people start to say, <clears throat> wait a second, we could potentially cause more damage than help the economy by uh, continuing to yeah. raise rates for too far? Let's dive into it right now. And what we do is we don't kill two birds with one stone. We kill two turkeys with one stone, giving mm. you the Thanksgiving angle. We do that with Troy Gajewski, Chief Market Strategist, FS Investments, with a ton of experience of global Wall Street and New York Wall Street. Troy, before we get to your 6040 comments, I want to talk to you about the state of hedge funds given the stunning year we've had. How is 80, 20, 2, and 20 doing? How are they doing this year? Yeah, so it depends on the strategy, Tom. I mean, it's actually been a very good year for multi-strategy solutions, whether they're Daily 40 Act or whether they're the classic QP structures. Um, there's been big dispersion across markets, yes. particularly if you look at rates versus currency, or you look at uh, trade opportunities like shorting uh, mortgages versus treasuries. So that's been a very attractive place to be. Um, systematic trend followers have also had a very strong year. Uh, there's been huge trends, as you know, whether it's the dollar or commodities or rates moving higher. Right. Um, and, and the strategies that struggled the most, of course, have been the growth-oriented long-short equity strategies that, you know, got a little too over their skis in terms of growth and go-go growth and perhaps got a little too involved in privates at elevated valuations. So, you know, in general, we think, you know, liquid multi-strategy solutions continue to make sense. Uh, you know, in, if you're going for income, you can look at things like FSCO, which we recently listed, which has income plus right. uh, appreciation potential that trades at a discount to NAV. Um, so lo lots to do in the hedge fund space, lots to do in the alternative space. And when you look at 6040 in the heart of your note, we've had a lot of different conversations of bond price up, yield down. Is the big shock next year that 6040 comes back with a vengeance? Yeah, so coming back with the vengeance would be a very strong term. I, I think one of our major themes, you know, our major theme for this year has been protect capital, don't be a hero, be in the northwest quadrant, the efficient frontier, right? Accept lower risk and either get a total return from income or through multi-strategy solutions. As we move through this cycle, uh, the next theme over the next several years will be, you know, cash flow is king in that you don't need price appreciation to make a reasonable return. As long as we don't have a horrific uh, recession where default rates skyrocket, your loss-adjusted yield on cash flow should be pretty attractive. So that doesn't mean it's time to dramatically ramp up risk or, or rotate back aggressively in the 60-40. What it means is if you're going to accept risk in your portfolio and be in that northeast quadrant, make sure you're doing it in strategies that have ample income and that can provide a buffer and also give you positive convexity if next year turns out better uh, than we think it will. So where does Bitcoin fit in, considering that you were bullish on the asset class not so long oh, ago? you are so cruel. Yeah, well, look, hey, before, so thanks, again, again, Lisa, we've talked about this many times, right? Bitcoin is the most cyclical asset on the planet. It goes through meteoric bull markets like it did in 2021. Um, eventually, as demand exhausts itself, uh, supplies inelastic to price, right? So whether Bitcoin's at a million dollars or a dollar, 900 come out a day. And that's the reason you have these huge cycles. So there's really two approaches to owning crypto. And when we talk about crypto, we Bitcoin specifically, either have a tiny allocation in your overall asset uh, mix, ride the, the higher highs and higher lows, or trade the cycle. But clearly as the Fed continues to tighten monetary policy, 
um, any directionally long asset is going to have a much more challenging environment well, than it did in 20 and 21. Hold on a second, Troy, because what you're saying right now challenges the sort of existential angst that you hear across the board of people saying Bitcoin's done, it's all a Ponzi scheme, forget about it. And we've heard that from the likes, even of Neil Kashkari of the Federal Reserve. How much are you pushing back against that, saying this is here to stay? And are you among those tracking when there could be a good entry point, not necessarily bailing with all uh, get out? Yeah, look, look, so, I mean, it's same as it ever was, right? Like, Bitcoin has incredible cycles. Uh, you know, meteoric gains, whether it's 64x or 32x or 8x in the last cycle, and then 70 to 80% drawdowns, but it always survives because of the strength of the network. Um, so we certainly think Bitcoin will be around for the long haul, uh, but it's very, very volatile. Um, and, you know, most of what's gone on here recently is just bad actors in the space. It really doesn't speak to the negativity or, or negatively reflect on uh, Bitcoin itself. It more uh, reflects negatively on some of the actors that were attracted to the asset class, uh, which is a, a incredibly unfortunate and, and just calls for the fact that we need more regulation, without a doubt. Troy Gasky, thank you so much with FS Investments there on 2 and, and 20. I misspoke there, and uh, the banner was my fault wrong. I made a mistake. That's my, that's my Thanksgiving mistake, folks. 2% and 20% payout on hedge funds, and also, of course, on his investment view forward with FS in Investments as well. Pharaoh would never would have done that. You were ruthless in your Bitcoin questions, what, Gasky. That I asked ruthless. him about Bitcoin? No, really? And, and his view as well. Well, his view isn't ruthless. It's fascinating, and it really highlights that there are people that come in and buy Bitcoin. And that's what we're seeing. People are not necessarily bailing. They're not liquidating everything. It's not going to zero across the board, regardless of FTX, which is interesting. It's why we haven't seen more contagion. This is the broader market story. Why have we not seen bigger fallout See from the her, fact that her, there's a big... Her voice, it's like at the Thanksgiving table when the Bram, when Abramowitz and the Keene family are together, is your voice changes. To what? When you're lecturing me on Bitcoin. <laughs> well, Do you know how I, I feel about this? Well, I know that you think that it's all ridiculous, but there are a lot of people who don't, which is the reason well, why I you're thought not you, seeing... People Troy really was cogent, and as you say, he stated the case for being opportunistic given 20000 to 16000 And there's a stark difference in view between those who are going to be opportunistic and those who are saying it's the end of an era, an end of an industry that grew right. out of extraordinary monetary policy. Citigroup, they publish on John Deere. Mr. Thane says simply, forget about PCAG. Revenues were the big surprise. Up, up, up on John Deere. Citigroup enthused on agriculture forward. Stay with us a Wednesday before Thanksgiving. We didn't mention Morocco, Croatia. We didn't. I think we tried. Go there. I think we it tried, but failed. we failed. <laughs> Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Chesapeake, Virginia, a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed. The shooter is also dead, although authorities aren't sure how he died. At least five people were wounded. Chesapeake is Virginia's second largest city and is located next to Norfolk and Virginia Beach. The top judges in the UK have thrown out Scotland's latest bid for independence. The Supreme Court ruled unanimously that a second referendum would have to be approved by the British government. Now that thwarts nationalist leader Nicola Sturgeon's plan for a vote next year. Bloomberg has learned that the European Union is discussing capping the price of Russian crude oil at between $65 and $70 a barrel. The Group of Seven is also involved in the talks. EU ambassadors are meeting today with the aim of approving the cap mechanism and a proposed price level. Credit Suisse is warning that it will report a loss of up to $1.6 billion for the fourth quarter. Clients pulled as much as $88 billion of their money from the bank in the first few weeks of that quarter. He underscored concerns over restructuring efforts after years of scandal. Manhattan's Upper Fifth Avenue is now the most expensive retail district in the world. That's according to a survey by commercial property firm Cushman and Wakefield. Fifth Avenue beat out last year's number one, Hong Kong Sim Sha Sui District. Rents in Hong Kong plummeted due to COVID curbs and restrictions on visitors. Global news 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
mentoring also can come from men, and it's one of the qualities, I guess, that you found in your mentors that also pushed you up. Do we need even more nurturing post-pandemic? Is the, is the way that we you know, talk with employees going to change? I think talent becomes a single biggest differentiator of a successful entity versus an unsuccessful entity. So you've got to do everything possible to hire, train, retain, put your arms around talent. I mean, you've really got to focus on your talent. Um, in the past, it's always been give them money, uh, you know, show them that they have an upward mobility and can make even more money. And that's the only reason uh, people come to work. I think post pandemic, we are seeing more and more people say, I have to worry about me as a person. I have to worry about my family. I want to worry about my well-being, my mental health. So we've got to start uh, encompassing people as holistic humans as opposed to a tool of the trade, which means that we have to engage with them head, heart, and hands, not just head and hands. The heart has to be engaged. So we have to be, show more empathy, uh, show, show that we care that they're citizens of the community, they're members of the family, and all of those have to come into consideration as we help an executive or an employee be an employee and be a person of the community and the family. The stakes are higher. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. You will shed light on dark matter. You will make aging optional. Because when you subscribe to Bloomberg, you won't just get news. You will get insight into limitless possibilities. Before you change the world, Bloomberg. Lots happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From businesses most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the ballpark. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. We're in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution coupled with the speed of the digital revolution. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning, everyone. Lisa Bramitz and Tom Keen. Seriously, John Farrell off for a, a, a good rest, a good deserved rest as well. We're making a lot of jokes about it, but I went back and forth with John uh, yesterday. He had some good things on Saudi Arabia and um, uh, the, the huge upset with Argentina back 20 years to Senegal and uh, France. 20 years is, he, is the opinion of Mr. Farrell. Well, it was a huge upset, but the most amazing thing, Lionel Messi, the star of Argentina, <clears throat> is an ambassador to Saudi Arabia. So how awkward is that? It's un-American. Well, know, it's not. It's Saudi Arabia it. and Argentina. It's not American. We digress right now. We'll do this with politics with Amory Horton on a deserved rest after uh, the G20 uh, meetings in Bali. And it is an honor to speak to someone, the third largest producers of Turkey in the world, Minnesota taking the top uh, notch. But Arkansas, with their leadership on poultry, which means there's only one person we can talk to, French Hill. Here's the reality, folks. You can go out and get a prairie turkey for $119 for the beast, or you can go to French Hill's Walmart and pony up for the organic beast at $21.80. What was the choice, French Hill? The fancy organic beast, or did you go to Bentonville, Arkansas? Tom, Lisa, good morning. We went straight Walmart yesterday, but the price tag was still shocking. But we're getting ready around our house for 14 tomorrow, so Walmart was our partner in crime. I will not mince words, and let's get serious, French Hill. It is a time of immense American tumult in the justice wing, the executive wing, the legislative wing, and everybody affected differently by this inflation. What is the prescription of a Republican majority in the House? 
Well, Tom, this has been a persistent and stubborn problem for over two years. Uh, you and I have talked about the origins many times from too loose monetary policy and continuing to be too accommodative in, in the end of 2020, and then an abundant amount of spending, some $5 trillion of, of extra spending green-lighted by Joe Biden. So, look, the Fed is now doing what it needs to do, which is to raise rates and battle inflation, but it's up against uh, fiscal uh, and regulatory policy. So Republicans want to control federal spending, go back to pre-pandemic spending levels, prioritize spending, roll back regulatory burdens that makes it harder to hire somebody or harder to unleash American energy. So I think you'll see us work to curtail spending, lighten the regulatory footprint, make the uh, personal tax cuts in the Trump Tax Cuts and Jobs Act permanent. These will be some of the legislative ideas that we'll bring forth next spring. How much do we have a leader from the Republican Party? Do you have someone who you think supports the views that you put forward in terms of how to curtail inflation best? Well, you know, Lisa, we worked uh, for uh, 18 months inside the House Republican Conference to develop ideas across the conference and make sure these were ones that were supported by a majority of our members. And I think this tax, regulatory, and spending agenda, uh, that view is all shared uh, by House Republicans under the leadership of Kevin McCarthy, who I believe uh, will be the next Speaker of the House in January. Are you going to be supporting uh, Donald Trump for another term as president? You know, I saw where Donald Trump got in the uh, in the race, uh, but we have so many talented people in the Republican Party that are between 45 and 65 years old. And I've been saying for a couple of years, since the 2020 election, I'm ready for generational change uh, for our leadership to run for president. And I think that's true for well, the Democrats, too. I think Americans are looking for new candidates from both parties. Now, come on, French Hill. You're going to have a Thanksgiving and 24 people. You're cooking three birds from Walmart. You get the whole thing. And full disclosure, folks, there are no Democrats at the, fr at the Hill household uh, here tomorrow. <laughs> You've got a new Republican Party where a GOP establishment like you, is trying to find its footing, its grounding against the supporters of the former president. What's that going to look like over the next six months? What exactly does the GOP establishment do? How do they move forward? Well, I think uh, being the uh, House Republicans will control the only modest part of government. I think we need to work together and have a consensus on the priorities of improving American security, for example, on the border, improving in the economy and fighting inflation, and uh, working together. And I think we'll do that in the House. We'll have those discussions in the House, but we'll have consensus going forward. That's what we have to do if we're going to counter the, the Biden administration. Uh, let's look through the microcosm of agricultural production. I mentioned earlier, folks, the leadership of Arkansas in poultry production and certainly uh, world class in production of turkey as well. Give us the labor update you're hearing from your business leaders directly in poultry, say Tyson's and the rest, or around them, the huge Arkansas ecosystem that supports poultry manufacture. Still, there's a shortage of uh, qualified labor up and down that supply chain in agriculture, uh, and there's no doubt about that. Uh, the innovation is still there. The expansion is still there. The financing is still there. I've talked to several producers in the last few weeks that are planning on uh, expanding their operations in 2023, but labor remains uh, a challenge. French Hill, thank you so much. We'll be over there. We'll try to get there you by bet. 12 noon for Detroit Lions as well. Congressman Look French to Hill. It. I'll bring stuff in. All are welcome. Uh, Co Congressman French Hill uh, celebrating Thanksgiving. What did he say, 25 people, something like that? <laughs> it's going to be fun. He doesn't have a New the... York apartment. Yeah. He's got like 8,000 square feet. The dining room is bigger than yours or my I apartment. I love Thanksgiving right? conversations. What do you think will be the theme? And last year it was Bitcoin, right? That was sort of the, the sort of hot topic at Thanksgiving. Now it's what? They always put me, I mean, even today, whoever the oldest person in the room is, grandma or grandpa is like 87 years old and needs help, and I'm sitting 
next to them making light conversation. <laughs> You're looking forward to this, aren't you? I guess you'll be ordering out from Shake Shack as well. No, no. We're, we're uh, you know, full disclosure. We, we celebrate with Mr. DeCoste. We're very fortunate to get a chair at Benoit. Sold out. I mean, it's, it's just great. And the only thing I have to do is to get down on my knees and say in French, please cook the damn bird. Because the French undercook everything. I'd like and to I'm see like, you please. say that. Even the beginning um, of that. Ah, uh, s'il vous plaît. <laughs> Cooker, <All right>. poulet. <laughs> okay. Next before we stop and uh, just insulting all uh, our French watchers, I will say that this this sort of uh, missive from the USDA is interesting to me. The sort of battle of the sources in terms of just how inflationary oh, the key this Thanksgiving will be. with reporting. Yeah, the key with reporting that the USDA is saying that Americans who want a turkey will be able to get one. This according to the Biden administration. And we're looking right now at grocery prices, mm -hmm. uh, according to this report, only uh, being a 1% to 6% increase year over year. So. I don't buy it. I, I'm just anecdotally, I am shocked at what I see in the grocery store. I don't the, buy it. The distinction here, as we heard from French Hill, he went to Walmart to go grocery shopping. Yes, true. A lot of true, people who true. previously went to Whole Foods, who previously went to some of these other places, are no, going this to is Walmart, well which said. is the reason why yeah. it's gaining share in the grocery uh, grocery section. You're seeing a downshifting, even among people who are uh, mm -hmm. of more means, and that perhaps is one of the keys of this entire He was cycle. out doing a fundraiser in the parking lot. <laughs> oh, I just, we, oh, didn't, boy. we didn't really no. mean that. No, we didn't. What we're following, seriously, folks, on a Wednesday of non-news, no, that is not true. It's not news. Credit Suisse with huge withdrawals from their wealth management shocks the Swiss banking system. They get approval at the same time in an emergency meeting to raise another $4 billion equity. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Material samples brought back from objects in space can shed light on billions of years of our solar system's history, including details about the origin of life here on Earth. A piece of an asteroid is a, a piece of the earliest beginnings of the solar system. But picking up rocks from the surface of an asteroid or planetary satellite isn't as easy as it sounds. It requires voyages of millions of miles to bodies that have never been seen up close. Probes need to land on surfaces with weak gravitational pulls, where the surface terrain is completely unknown, gather samples, and then make the long trip back. And while behemoths like NASA and SpaceX grab right. headlines, it's a relatively young space agency. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, better known as JAXA, that is taking the giant leap necessary to bring the mysteries of space back down to Earth.
please, you've got to explain this one to me. What does it mean when the White House says we're watching markets carefully? It means they have a Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. They have. I've been in and seen it. Lots of Bloombergs. Lots of Bloomberg. Lots of Bloomberg. Lots of Bloomberg. Lots of Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. I've seen the Bloomberg. What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means they have a Bloomberg. to the world of business. Balance of Power with David Weston brings you news, analysis, and insight from and about politics power players. Balance of Power, weekdays on Bloomberg. Bloomberg Surveillance, good morning. Let's do a data check. Really haven't done one all morning. John Farrow emails in and says, do a data check. He's starving for a data check. Futures up four. John, Dow futures up 11 points here, fractionally, but green on the screen. Hey, all in all, the VIX, uh, really a huge day yesterday for the VIX. Call it a 24 level in under 22 as well. We'll have to see where that goes uh, with some of the enthusiasms we see out there on a holiday uh, lengthened work week. Yield, a little bit of a move higher, 4.54% on the two year. 10 year yield, 3.77%. Two cent spread is my news, negative yeah. 78 basis points. Let's stop there, Lisa. I'm sorry, that's a big deal. It's Further a short inversion. term. It's short term. The Fed's going to keep raising rates and keep it there. And we're going to hear perhaps more on that with meeting minutes later today. On the longer end, people are looking at perhaps a souring outlook, but not necessarily the hard landing that some people were expecting. What I'm looking at, some specific stocks uh, that really caught my attention, Deer, Please. you mentioned, and this I think is important, Deer shares yep. popping after reporting better than expected earnings. Uh, the shares had been up as much as almost 8%, now up just 4%, but still, the outlook is good. And how much is this really mm. a situation with a company that's navigated well, and how much is it? They're in the sweet spot for agriculture right. at a time when prices are going up. We talk about Thanksgiving. To strategy, and your need to make money because you're buying the organic bird at $119 uh, per bird. Let's do that. Did you finish with your equity thing? No, I was going to mention a couple of things. Keep going. Keep going. I'm right. sorry. I don't uh, need to interrupt. I just HP, was enthused. HP Inc., which makes all Hewlett sorts of personal uh, computing devices, Hewlett said that it would cut as many as 6,000 jobs yesterday. And this uh, is sort of building on the tech cuts. Those shares up about 2.5% minus but a bit. I'm glad you feature this different, though, than the panic of OMG. We got something wrong. This is a more three-year strategic Strategic right. being key, yeah. and the reward that you're seeing in markets shows that that rationalizing is definitely gaining steam across uh, the entire tech industry. And Nordstrom just shows the tale of two retails, down uh, almost 8% those shares after uh, reporting worse than expected earnings. And this, to me, is interesting. Gross margin not doing it. And this is really how much we're seeing the winners and losers in retail. It's, it, and again, uh, I think we, it's been great on that. And, and of course, the polarity there is Target really struggling and others doing better. Yeah. How, mean, much how much is this execution? How much is it execution? How much is it macro? <clears throat> As I was saying, you need to pay for the bird and you do that with currency trades. Eric Nelson joins us now, currency strategy in London with Wells Fargo. Eric, thank you so much for joining us and the specificity of your against consensus, resilient and strong dollar comes over to cable where you initiate a trade, folks. This is how it works for pros. At 119 sterling, down to a weaker sterling, 114, and you put in a stop at 121.25. Essentially, if you get the trade wrong, you're going to go out at 121.25. Explain how often, Eric, you have to use a stop loss. Does that happen frequently? Every time, Tom. i uh, got to manage the risk. And it's look, it's a very volatile market. Uh, you certainly have to set some tight stop, uh, relatively wide stops, uh, unless you want to get stopped out very quickly with the volatility where it is. But you look at sterling and uh, uh, close to 120 especially, I think this is a very attractive risk toward here. Even with a lot of people starting right. to say, oh, well, the, the dollar long trade is over. Uh, this, to, to us, this is really the, the place you want to focus our attention when thinking about right. dollar going up. Let's go type one, type two. Not your enthusiasm for the dollar, but what do they get wrong in screaming weak dollar? Well, there's a little bit too much focus placed on this one CPI print. And there's also a, a question of, okay, so the energy crisis has stopped getting worse. Uh, you know, China has, in, in some sense, stopped getting worse. 
Um, you know, it's not reopening at the pace we thought it was. Um, but also the Fed has also stopped getting even more aggressive on a sequential basis. When we think about the level, though, of relative growth, relative yield, the dollar is still very attractive, Tom. Uh, you know, U.S. versus Europe, U.S. versus U.K., uh, it still screams dollar higher from my perspective. So putting aside some short-term choppiness around the holiday, you still think dollar rallies into year-end. What about next year, Eric? It seems like the new consensus is you're going to see a peak in the first half of next year and then some pretty steady weakness into the second half. Do you agree? Yeah, Lisa, I think we, I certainly could see a situation where the dollar does peak out next year. The question is, what gets us there? And, and, and a lot of the arguments I'm hearing are not particularly convincing. Now, there's a soft landing argument, which I think is, you know, maybe a little bit far-fetched, but should it happen, I mean, there's absolutely a case for, for dollar to go lower. But I do sort of worry, you know, in a situation where maybe we see a milder recession in the U.K. and Europe um, and, and the U.S. Um, kind of muddles through, that relative rates and growth story to me is still so compelling. I don't see that changing materially enough to really move the dollar lower materially at least in the first half of next year. So it's at least an H2 story, and even then, I'm not fully convinced at this point. How much is positioning against your view? In other words, how much could you actually see a boon just simply because people are moving away from the strong dollar call and really starting to bet a little bit more on some sort of weakening? Well, Lisa, I like to say this has been the, the least loved dollar rally in history. Uh, throughout the year, we've gotten, we've gotten tons of pushback on the dollar bullish call, uh, leverage funds have largely sat out the rally if you look at positioning. Asset managers have, have really cleared out a lot of their dollar long positions. So if I look at positioning as it stands right now, it's very much, much more neutral than it was at the beginning of the year. And overall, if anything, maybe leans short dollars in some pairs. So I think the consensus is moving toward uh, the sort of dollar weaker story, which to me signals that positioning actually mm -hmm. is uh, a better place for dollar to go higher here. Eric, I got sucked into buying the organic hoity-toity turkey. I desperately need big figure moves now. Where's the big figure win in EM right now? Where's the trade? That, I mean, do you go Argentina because they lost to Saudi Arabia? Where's the EM, where's the EM pair that's going to uh, make some money here in the next six weeks? Well, a lot of it's going to hinge on, on China, I think, Tom. And, and if we do really see... Um, so, some improvement on, on the China side. It, Dollar Korea has been one that has moved an absolute ton this year. Um, the issue is I don't, I don't think we're going to get that improvement for uh, at least uh, six weeks. So I think continuing to focus on on LATAM, um, if we do see, you know, if, if I'm wrong and the dollar uh, actually goes the other way here, um, some of these, these Latin American pairs, um, even despite some recent moves, probably have more room to run given the carry. Eric, right, as I read all of the notes for the year ahead next year, I'm struck by how many people believe in a soft landing, and it doesn't mean necessarily that we're going to avoid recession, but it will be shallow, it will be short, and then we'll emerge on the other side somewhere around September of next year. It seems like this is becoming increasingly consensus. Do you push back on that? Yeah, it, it's a little bit hard, especially if I look outside the U.S., Lisa. I look at the housing market situation and some of these other developed market economies, you know, the U.S. Is, is certainly looking a little bit precarious, but Canada, uh, Australia, some of these other markets are very precarious. we got to worry about uh, the Chinese property sector, which um, everyone seems to think is, is pretty much fully contained. Um, there's a lot of risks that are still out there, and I'm not saying that the, the soft landing can't happen, but I think we've had one or two um, you know, good uh, CPI reports, and people have, have been a little bit too quick to, to extrapolate from that and think we can actually emerge from this unscathed. Eric, now for the really important question. As an expat in London, are you celebrating Thanksgiving? Are there other expats? Is there a Thanksgiving vibe? Uh, not as much as I would uh, I would hope. I imagine it feels uh, somewhat similar to uh, July 4th around here. Uh, I think the World Cup is really what's, what's uh, taking everyone's attention, though, and uh, certainly right. looking forward to U.S.-England on Friday. Eric Nelson, a safe answer. With Wells Fargo, he'll keep his <laughs> yeah, job at least fair. Monday as well. But seriously, folks, there, it's a really, it's not an outlier call. I'm not going to say that much, but it's a very articulate call pushing against a consensus of flat to weaker dollar. Dollar is a trade to, to always get wrong. I mean, how many times have we headed into a year with people having conviction about the dollar that 
is turned on its head pretty quickly. It's hard to game out because of all of the variables, and we're not even tracking interest rate uh, differentials anymore. Do I get bonus points on a Wednesday for insulting all of France? I mean, everyone's emailed in but Lagarde and Macron. Oh, yeah, what are they saying? <laughs> They're very, they thought I insulted by saying that, that sometimes the, the poulet is undercooked a little bit. I like it, I like it more cooked. I thought that they were offended by your accent. Yeah. So you like wait, you like dry turkey? I don't like it dry, but I just like it cooked like medium well. I don't know. What do you? I don't know how you call a turkey. I mean, I'm ignorant on this. What I do like is Alan Ducasse's poached pears, pear sorbet, and chocolate sauce. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. You're really you're really commuting with the uh, inflation story at Alan Ducasse. Uh, definitely uh, not very relatable. No, it's, it's there. It's Thanksgiving. And again, we should mention travel. We really haven't done the airline racket. It's going to be nuts again. Yeah, probably. And this is some area that's completely booned. I mean, this is the thing about this inflationary moment is that, you know, you have companies oh. that are reporting negative earnings, and then you go to the airplane uh, industry, and they can't <clears throat> charge enough. You can't afford um, it. They're packed. It may be Jeff Curry he, uh, dovetails into Jennifer McCune earlier. Yeah, but some of the data in the how grim is the united kingdom seriously yeah, it's, it's and really jennifer rough. McCune, a capital economics folks saying you know what it's really maybe not all that bad that's well, the that first whisper i've heard although we did see that with the da the data overnight the pmi data out of europe that it wasn't as bad as people had expected it came in it's still in recession territory but better than um than anticipated is it sustainable right is this a one kind of one-time event because oil prices have not been going up as quickly and because of the gas stockpiles. Right. Can they contain this? You know what's amazing? Dennis Gartman emails in, good morning, Mr. Gartman. Lovely to hear from you on the day before Thanksgiving. And what's amazing from him, he carves the beast from the lower right to the upper left. Thank it's, you. I appreciate from the, that. From the upper left to the lower right. It's short turkey here. He carves a beast in the way of a chart. Well, Only Gartman would do that. Carving charts the way he would do a turkey you know. um, or, or vice versa. I'm curious to see where we go with the slew of data. I mean, how nice is the Federal Reserve? Seriously here. In 45 minutes. minutes. <laughs> in 45 and then minutes. At 2 p.m., people are going to be getting ready for the Thanksgiving and pouring over the uh, meeting minutes for the Federal Reserve, including you, Tom. 40 minutes. Economic data here. There's a lot of it out durable goods and of course uh, we see on claims as well uh, before Thursday and also Germany, Japan. Bloomberg yeah. surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world. With the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman is also dead, although police aren't sure how he died. Disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange FTX has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman Freed outlined what he called a crash in collateral from $60 billion to $9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. Well, it's a major blow to Donald Trump. The Supreme Court has cleared the way for a House committee to get six years of the former president's tax returns. It's a resounding triumph for Democrats after a three-year battle. Still, they have only a few weeks left to review the returns before Republicans take control of the House. There were violent protests at Apple's main iPhone-making making plant in China. Now, hundreds of workers at the Foxconn factory battled security personnel after almost a month of tough restrictions intended to quash a COVID outbreak. Now, according to witnesses, the protests started overnight over unpaid wages and fears of spreading infection. And the world's largest maker of agricultural machinery expects a profit surge to a record next year. Deere is projecting net income for the fiscal year that beat Wall Street estimates. That's after posting better than expected fourth quarter earnings. Deere has benefited from the rise in farmers' incomes. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
When you think of cutting edge technology at sea, you might be thinking of stuff like this. But there's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90% of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3% of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3% may not sound like a lot, but that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? No one covers the world like Bloomberg. My team thinks 2023, we avoid a recession. I'm a little more skeptical about that. China and the U.S. both do not want to see nuclear force on the European continent. The regulators here in the Bahamas are ongoing with their investigation into FTX. With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. CEO Mark Rowan. In January, Apollo closed its $11 billion all-stock merger with Athene Holding. It had already owned 35% of the insurer. Here's what Apollo gets out of the deal. Assets under management. Apollo expects them to double to about a trillion dollars by 2026. Much of that projected growth will come from the merger. And those assets are especially attractive to Apollo. Insurance companies typically go after much more modest returns than buyout investors. That will give Apollo more options for investing the cash. Athene is a steady provider of fee income. It has grown into one of the nation's biggest holders of fixed annuities, those retirement savings products favored by risk-adverse customers. The merger will also allow Apollo to simplify its governance. It gave up its dual-class share structure and adopted a one-share, one-vote plan. The hope is that will eventually lead to Apollo's inclusion in the S&P 500. Inflation became a lot uh, more pervasive, more entrenched, and also the pressures have intensified after the war. Monetary policy has to continue to be decisive. It has to uh, do what the monetary policy has to do in order to get out of this situation. From Portugal, Alvaro Pereira, really an informed interview yesterday about the vector lower on real GDP growth, the vector higher on inflation, the readjustment of OECD yesterday. Lisa, I thought that was a really important interview. Especially because they do see uh, not necessarily a global recession, but really slow growth, especially led by the developed world. Uh, time is precious. Let's get right to it. He's been with us daily on the story of his China and the current joints from Hong Kong. Bloomberg Chief Asia Economics Correspondent. The video is stark, and, uh, and I would suggest the video changes the dialogue of the politics of Beijing. If we look at the Apple manufactory in China, it is at least protest. It is at least people standing around with the car, the, the police cars, et cetera. And the overwhelming size of Foxconn, how big it is, how does Beijing respond to the video of protest in China? Well, this is pretty rare, Tom, and I think a lot of analysts are saying it speaks to the frustrations on the ground and now in China in terms of the ongoing COVID zero policy. In this particular case, as you mentioned, it's it's Apple's main iPhone plant in China. We saw through the videos those uh, workers breaking out from their dormitories, clashing with the staff. The complaints were said to be the complaints were said to be over salaries and over fear of of cap, of catching the virus. Foxconn themselves have said the factory is working and back in operational order tonight. But the point of it all is that it is unusual. It's a rare glimpse. You know, we always speak about how can we capture what's going on on the ground in terms of sentiment in China. Well, this is something that's come through the social media chain. Other posts that express frustration towards COVID-0 do get censored on, on, a, 
on a regular basis. Uh, and I think it speaks to the complications that China's trying to do here. They're trying to, right. on the one hand, control COVID. On the other hand, they want to allow their economy to breathe. Uh, our conversation, I believe, yesterday or the day before was 800 miles northwest of Hong Kong, relatively deep into China, into Sichuan. Do we have any reporting of other protests in a very large China, or is it just visible protests around the three great cities? It's mostly, sometimes it's leaks out on social media, Tom. There have been other protests or at least expressions of objections to COVID-0 leaking out on social media in recent days, but they're getting censored. But that's the only real kind of gauge of sentiment that we have. Obviously, the official and the state press aren't going to really carry it. What we saw at Foxconn plant on that video that our colleagues worked on today, that's obviously pretty, pretty rare and unusual to have it on that scale. It has happened in the past at some plants, but this is pretty unusual. And as I said to you, it doesn't just speak to the frustrations on the ground. We're starting to see the policymakers getting nervous. We had news tonight before I came on that the central bank is going to try and put more money into the economy to make sure that it doesn't die, uh, to make sure that it at least has some support going into the crucial winter months that are coming up on that will be a big test, of course, of COVID zero. The problem with that is everybody knows the economy doesn't need more money at the moment. Nobody wants to borrow. It's all because of COVID zero weighing on the consumer on one side and, of course, the real estate slump weighing on consumers on the other side. Well, and this really highlights also the policymakers on the, on the official side, local policymakers that are kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place. They're being challenged with increasing growth and trying to focus more on economic momentum and, at the same time, it's still tasked with clamping down on COVID. And it seems like that sort of angst was underpinning what happened at the Foxconn factory. How much are you starting to care pushback from local officials saying we can't do this it's a paradox well you're absolutely right lisa uh, you've summed it up completely correctly there there's a bit of having your cake and eating it going on there's there was something of a a shift in COVID strategy in recent weeks which broadly speaking said look try and avoid ma avoid mass lockdowns and broad restrictions be more targeted close off blocks and areas and allowed economy to stay on, on its feet. But like you're saying, obviously, that's very difficult to pull off. The local officials are faced with, well, do we try and do that and allow the virus to spread, or, or do we throw a blanket over their whole city uh, and suffocate the virus? But to, to the latter end of your point, I don't know how much scope they have for pushback with the central government. I mean, the central government is saying they're delegating, we're giving the responsibility to you, you can manage the virus best, but I'm not sure any local authority would like to see the virus spread out of control uh, you know, this side of the Shandu's New Year, which comes early, it comes in January, and of course then ahead of the big NPC in March where President Xi gets crowned. Uh, there are certainly lots of political tensions still surrounding COVID in China. It strikes me there's also quite a bit of confusion around just how much the COVID strategy has changed, right? We heard a slight shift in tone from Xi Jinping, and yet at the same time, the COVID clampdowns are still occurring. Do you have a sense of how much things have actually changed? I mean, they've made tweaks. We do know that tweaks on the quarantine on arrival, for example. They've lifted the flight bans. Uh, they've, lift, they've made changes to the testing requirements, at least for those coming into the international border. On the ground, as we were saying, it's meant to be more targeted. They don't want to have mass lockdowns like they did in Shanghai a few months ago. But, you know, the real politique comes back to what authority really is right. going to allow the virus, the virus to spread while. That comes with significant political, political cost. And to very quickly here, the great James Fallows in The Atlantic 10 years ago wrote a brilliant informative essay on Foxconn then. What does Foxconn actually look like in 2022? Well, it's a powerful company. It's a huge employer. Uh, it's, as we said, it's home to the biggest Apple iPhone plant right now in the world. So it's at the center of global supply chains. It's at the center of the global consumer story. Uh, and they have said that their plant is back up and running tonight. They've said they've got it functioning again. So I think it's very essential to the China industrial and the global consumer story, Tom. And thank you so much, Daly, with us. I think end of tomorrow we will not bother you. It's just possible. <laughs> and Thanksgiving we will not bother, bother end of current. I saw one statistic this morning, Lisa, a labor force of 200,000 at Foxconn. I mean, can, I, I don't think we have, we, I can't frame that. I, I know I can't frame An entire that. ecosystem, an entire city.
devoted yeah. to manufacturing four out of five of the uh, main iPhones. You've mentioned this before, and I think it's an important point, this idea that uh, it's not just hard for Apple to withdraw from, from China because of its reliance on the Foxconn factories, et cetera, but because it sells a lot of the iPhones to China, right? I mean, it's a big business for them. When you get this type of disruption, you do wonder at what point you start to get some product shortages that cause Apple to rethink some of the production lines while also not angering Chinese officials at a time when that's a huge market for them. And I mentioned today, Lisa, really, really important. All of a sudden, we become really accommodative on the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index. It has been, I think, underreported. It's walking in the other direction for Chairman Powell from restriction, yeah. tighter out there. Maybe with the equity markets up, that helps. Much more accommodative with the statistic of today a negative 0 0.50 standard deviations. For global Wall Street, that's of note. Yeah, year-end melt-up that uh, I know a lot of banks are oh, actually I like that. using. Thanks for, well, I this is what that? you've been talking about. You've been saying you can't bet against it. <clears throat> banks are using this opportunity to also get rid of some of the debt, the hung bridge loans yeah. and things like that on the books to try and a clean house ahead of whatever might happen I had year. a recollection Japan could surprise Germany. I don't think it's like a layup for Germany. It's I mean, after Argentina and Saudi Arabia, nothing seems like it's probably yeah. Uh, layup. We'll give you team coverage oh, yeah. here, World Cup coverage. <laughs> we'll do that with the Andrew Sheets of Morgan Stanley next. Stay with us. Today. didn't, would you want to go into government? If the president called you to serve our, con our country, would you go into government or would you start another company? I love what I do. And I, I feel like I have this luxury with 23andMe that um, it's, and it keeps evolving. You know, we started out just as a, um, you know, started out a consumer company. We're thick in research. We got into drug discovery in 2015 and now we're getting to the delivery of care. So, I've been really lucky with 23andMe that it's been endlessly interesting. And I'm surrounded by incredibly talented, brilliant individuals where I learn from them. And what I always advise people to do is like you should keep, you should take jobs where you're learning. And if you stop learning in a job, then you should quit. And like frankly, when people leave 23andMe, like I say, if you're not learning anymore, you should move on. So I, I'm 100% I'm committed to 23andMe. That said, my other passion is other direct-to-consumer. Like, I want to build out a true consumer-empowered healthcare world, like one that is outside of the existing system. And I do, there's no greater force than government.
Before you change the world, Bloomberg. Why do the biggest names in business choose Bloomberg? That is a great question. It's a great question. Great question. Great question. That's a question I get all night. Bloomberg. Top experts. Great questions. Power. Policy. Politics. From the White House to the Hill, Bloomberg covers the leaders in legislation. That was really a tectonic shift for this White House. The theory of this bill, as I understand it, is there'll be a multiplier effect. How do Democrats mobilize specifically younger voters? Bringing you the political news you need to know. The president has made it very clear that this is a significant focus. For the intersection of Wall Street and Washington, nobody covers politics like Bloomberg. looking for is inflation to start to come off the boil. The Fed you know, still has some way to go in terms of raising interest rates, but that those interest rate hikes are probably going to be smaller than what we've seen. The Fed just pauses in January and February, not necessarily you know, have to cut. That's kind of the, the green light for the equities. Monetary policy has to continue to be decisive. We still have you know, the uncertainty of a, of a Fed policy era. This is Bloomberg Surveillance with Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, and Lisa Abramowitz. It's the Thanksgiving data dump and a bit of an earnings data dump as well. It is Tom Keen, Jonathan Farrow, Lisa Abramowitz for Bloomberg Surveillance. Welcome back uh, on this pre-Thanksgiving day. And uh, Tom Keen, we see that John is off uh, what a well-deserved day off. But right now, it is not... Oh, yeah, cooking the beast. Yeah. We're trying to as well. It is a beast of information. It is not a slow day. It's not it a actually slow Wednesday. should be a Absolutely. slow Wednesday. It is not. We've got a whole host of data coming up here in about a half an hour. And then 2 p.m. Fed meeting minutes. Uh, what I would focus here right now is on stock selection. And it's going to be the theme. It, it, folks, seriously, it's not a quiet Wednesday. Very unusual. And we can just generalize Credit Suisse down under four Swiss francs per share. As we mentioned that story all through the hour. I think we've underplayed Lisa. John Deere, with the new price of 430 uh, maybe even 432 is up 48% oh, wow. from the July lows. It's not a moonshot. It doesn't look like Exxon. But we forget there is an industrial global America setting up for profit. I'm glad that you brought this up, the idea that we talk this macro talk with so many people who have these prognostications for what the world will do. And in the <clears throat> specific stock story, it is such a story by story kind of yeah. situation where you have the likes of Nordstrom not doing so well, then you've got the likes of Macy's knocking it out of the park. You've got the likes of Gap even doing better than people expected. It's just a motley picture, and getting the right names yeah. might be more important than perhaps and understanding the macro trends. I'm as full of this as any is anyone, and that you know we focus on global Wall Street, and that includes the soap opera Credit Suisse, but. Apple. It's so easy to talk about Apple. I have an Apple iPhone, and Afterthought wants a new one. Apple, you know, I mean, I've got a John Deere Zamboni, which I use in Central Park, but, <laughs> you know, deck. a Zamboni. That's yeah, what no, I know what a Zamboni is. Okay, I thought you, you used it on your deck. No, you I've know. got a John Deere Zamboni. It's really, really great, but mm -hmm. we don't talk enough about Industrial America. Well, and They're killing it. And this goes to Jeff Curry's point. We haven't necessarily invested Energy as well. in the old economy, and he was talking about how the bubbles of new technology, of new uh, of the new hot thing, typically uh, precede the increase in prices, the lack of investment that caused uh, some sort of inflationary boom in the 1970s and now today. How much are we also watching yeah. uh, what we're experiencing? And I do keep pointing to this at 2 p.m., the road ahead for the Fed. I know you don't like gaming this out, mm. but how much is that the important story to watch rather than the uh, company-specific types of stories? Well, I'm going to go to the claims. I mean, I know claims have been boring. You're going you're to go Fed minutes here, some, several, few, and all that. I'm going to go to what we're going to see in 27 minutes here, and it is now the time where we begin to see what the gloom crew feels is the lift up in the Layoffs. Most of the guests have pushed, including Congressman Hill, have pushed against the idea that layoffs are germane, tangible, countable. We'll see with claims in 20 minutes. And right now we are seeing uh, some firings in the tech space, but other places we're actually seeing hirings. So we can get into that in a minute. Right now what I'm seeing is a lift. That end of the year melt up that you were talking about never <clears> bet <throat> against the people who are trying to really uh, game a performance heading into year end. The NASDAQ up two tenths of a percent. Yields kind of range bound. I mean, honestly, this has been a market that has been slow to really respond to uh, to news that really is more company specific, perhaps, than it is. The macro. VIX is in ten big figures in this mini rally we've had 
3031 down to 21.67. This is a bull market no one loves. Is Mr. Nelson from Wells Fargo said it's dollar resilience no one loves. But is it riding it just until it can't have any more there steam? And the reason why I ask this is because of what you pointed <clears throat> to, the 210 spread, this classic benchmark of recession. Typically when it inverts, you have a recession about uh, 12 to 18 months later. Right now it's the most inverted going back to 1981. How much can you actually be optimistic about the equity story when light of some of that kind of mm, negative tea leaves. I know you got to get to Andrew here, but I mean, right now it's a tough call for Bloomberg surveillance. We're in consultation in the control room, folks. Do we chat Germany, Japan, or Lions Bills tomorrow? It's a tough call. We'll let uh, Andrew Sheets uh, determine that later, but let's you. first uh, get to what the macro call is. And I really want to start with this concept of trying to parse out some broader story amid myriad individual uh, stories and pictures that are idiosyncratic in nature. Andrew Sheets, Chief Cross Asset Strategist at Morgan Stanley, who's been nailing it this year. Andrew, how difficult was it to come up with some sort of scenario, some sort of roadmap for 2023? Well, thanks. It's, it's nice to be here with you. You know, I, I think the most striking thing about our outlook is that we are expecting <clears throat> 2023 to look very different. You know, I think 2020. Two was a year marked by extremely expensive starting valuations, resilient growth, very high, surprisingly high inflation, and then very hawkish policy. <clears throat> when we think about next year, you know, all of those elements are somewhat different. Valuations have normalized. We think growth will be weaker, but inflation will be lower and policy will be a lot less hawkish. So, you know, I think that that's for 2023, a, a consistent story, but also a very different story than what we've just seen this year. Right now, people are talking about a first half that's really painful, a second half that's positive, the melt up in 2023. How much do you buy into this belief that we're going to get some sort of peak inflation leading to a sense of an end that will come around June, July of 2023? Yeah, so I, so I think if I look at our outlook, you, you really have some 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 competing forces, uh, good versus bad. I think on the good side, we're, we're, we are in the camp that the Fed will be early to pause. We think the last Fed hike is in January. We think inflation will come down at a pretty healthy clip over 2023, both things that are quite helpful. But we also think earnings have a lot of downside in the U.S. My colleague Mike Wilson is you know more than 10 percent below consensus uh, for for yeah. earnings uh, in, in 2023. And so we think those competing forces mean that you want to be focused right. for now on high quality fixed income and later on trying to be more bullish on it. And this is a really important question for global, uh, global Wall Street. With great respect, Andrew Sheets, for your shop and the legacy of Stephen Roach, you guys fight visibly like cats and dogs. It's wonderful to see the Morgan Stanley process. I have a huge respect for it, folks. What's a distinctive debate right now? What's the singular thing that you're arguing about at Morgan Stanley? So I, I think there are a few things. We're always we're always debating. Uh, there are always a number of things under debate. I think this idea that inflation comes down and will it finally come down in 2023? Inflation was very hard to forecast in 2022. We struggled with forecasting inflation. The Fed struggled with it. A lot of forecasters struggled with it. I think there are a lot of good reasons why inflation comes down in 2023, but I think it's something that clearly there's a lot of right. uh, doubt around, uh, uncertainty around, given how hard it was to forecast. And then also I think this question of can the Fed really pause without reversing the progress that it's made in tightening financial conditions, right? Almost by definition, once it stops hiking, it's easing, and does that kind of work against everything right. the Fed's trying to achieve? So it's kind of how does it message that is, I think, a big debate. So then what do you and Ellen Zentner make of the new accommodation witnessed in the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index moving from a negative one standard deviation to a negative 0.5 standard deviation, shockingly accommodative over, let's say, the last 20 days? Yeah, so I, I do think this is a challenge the Fed is going to have, and, and we don't think, you know, we, we forecast the, lead, the last Fed hike to be in January, but we don't think, you know, at that January meeting, the Fed throws up its hands and says, this is it, you know, we're, we're done. We think the Fed will, will hike in January, and then as inflation continues to moderate into the first quarter, they will just simply be on hold. They will monitor the situation. They will emphasize that that hiking works with a long and variable leg. And we've just had the fastest 12-month pace of hiking 
in 40 years. So it, right. it wants to see how that plays out. But but clearly, as you mentioned, that that easing of financial conditions is a is a challenge, and I think is something the Fed takes quite seriously. Andrew Sheets, thank you so much for joining us this morning. An important conversation on this Wednesday. And again, I love the fractious nature of how Morgan Stanley makes the sausage. It's really, uh, I, I just think, absolutely original. Sometimes I miss it, folks, and I missed it this morning. And it's really good that we have listeners and viewers worldwide on us 24 7. Lisa, we were talking with French Hill of Arkansas and, of course, of Walmart in Bentonville, Arkansas. And I was completely remiss not to mention this horrific shooting with Congressman Hill. It's completely my fault, folks. And uh, I'm really upset about it, frankly. We should have brought up the issue of guns and mass shootings with a good gentleman from Arkansas. Especially because Walmart does sell guns. So will this yeah. change their policy? Also, we're just getting news uh, from the police uh, reporting that the Walmart shooter in Virginia was a company employee. Yeah. So we will bring you updates on that. But it raises this sort of polarizing issue of how do you deal with uh, something that has such huge divergence between two camps and between rural and yeah. urban and the realities of more populated areas and those where it's more recreational. And, and with, with Congressman Hill, it wasn't about Bentonville and it wasn't about his Arkansas. The last number of days have just been absolutely horrific going back to the University of Virginia. It's a tragedy. I mean, we report yeah. about this too often that we become numb to it, these shootings that take people's lives. I have become numb to it. I, I blew it. I didn't mention this with Congressman Hill. That's no not, other way to put it. I mean, it's a, an ongoing <clears throat> drumbeat. Also, we're getting some other headlines that I want to bring to you. Uh, all Ukrainian regions have emergency power cuts. This according to the grid operator. So <clears throat> the conflict is uh, developing over there. And I'm really struck by the ongoing conflict that also has become sort of benumbing in the background to people yeah. who are not involved but still very real and causing and real distress. I'm looking at a 26 degree statistic early next week for Kiev. Winter is upon them and uh, as, as we've seen in the news, Lord Maria Today are reporting on this. This is really um, serious uh, as well. It is a Wednesday. I thought it'd be a quiet Wednesday. We could make jokes about Thanksgiving. Well, we're doing that. But the fact is the news flow is extraordinary. We need an update on Bitcoin. We're going to get that from Shanali Basak, I believe, uh, here and much more towards Genesis of Connecticut as well. Joining us as well with an economic view from the measured Wilmington Trust, Luke Tilly will join us. Futures up five. Stay with us. This is Bloomberg. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. In Chesapeake, Virginia, a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed. That shooter was a company employee. That's according to police. He is also dead and believed to have killed himself. At least five people were wounded. Chesapeake is Virginia's second largest city and is located next to Norfolk and Virginia Beach. Bloomberg has learned that the European Union is discussing capping the price of Russian crude oil at between $65 and $70 a barrel. The group of seven also involved in the talks. EU ambassadors are meeting today with the aim of approving the cap and mechanism and a proposed price level. Mortgage rates in the U.S. dropped again for the second week in a row. According to the Mortgage Bankers Association, the rate on a 30-year fixed loan fell 23 basis points to 6.67% last week. That's the lowest in two months. That could give a bit of a boost to the struggling housing market. Credit Suisse is warning that it will report a loss of up to $1.6 billion for the fourth quarter. Clients pulled as much as $88 billion of their money from the bank in the first few weeks of that quarter. That underscored concerns over restructuring efforts after years of scandal. And there's no hiring slump in the professional services business. EY is on track to hire around 220,000 people in the year ending next July. EY's big four rivals, as top accounting firms are known, are also on hiring sprees. PwC brought on 148,000 new workers in the 2022 financial year. Global news, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
When the price of anything goes up, the consequences reach far beyond what you'd expect. But perhaps most of all, when it comes to food. In 2010, surging food prices helped spark the Arab Spring. Lives were lost, regimes fell, and the consequences are still with us. Once again, food prices are rising, and fast. Energy costs, broken supply chains, and surging demand were just some of the factors that have driven food prices to their first record high since the Arab Spring. And that's all before a war between two of the world's biggest food producers. Ukraine is called the bread basket of Europe, and taken with Russia, the two account for about a quarter of global wheat trade. They produce more than half of the world's sunflower seeds and oil, nearly 20% of the barley. Now throw in rising energy prices, and processing, transporting, even refrigerating food gets more expensive. Plus, fertilizer production is extremely energy intensive. Less fertilizer means lower crop yield, and prices rise even more. The pandemic revealed how complicated and fragile global trade systems are. Global agriculture, perhaps even more so. Unlike metals, for example, food goes bad. And crops take months to grow and are vulnerable to unpredictabilities like the weather. Rising food prices will be felt everywhere, but the poorest countries in the world will be hit the hardest. And as all these factors compound, the real fear is that record high will lead to record high and ultimately to a global food crisis with vast consequence. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. We're in the early stages of a sustainability revolution that has the magnitude of the industrial revolution coupled with the speed of the digital revolution. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. A lot's happening on Wall Street. I'm quite encouraged. The center is holding. Need to catch up? This is Bloomberg Wall Street Week. I'm David Weston. We've got the information and insights. A lot of these areas still have very, very good valuations. From business's most influential and instrumental. It's knocking it out of the bullpup. Now's not a great time to be speculative. It's time for a pivot. We're talking about a significant hit to our standard of living. Bloomberg Wall Street Week, live Friday with replays all weekend on Bloomberg Television and Radio. incredible cycles uh you know meteoric gains whether it's 64x or 32x or 8x in the last cycle and then 70 to 80 percent drawdowns but it always survives because of the strength of the network um so we certainly think bitcoin will be around for the long haul uh but it's very very volatile um and you know most of what's gone on here recently is just bad actors in the space troy guy esky uncommonly acute there on Bitcoin with FS Investments today. Lisa, there was, he had a real distinction there of the future of this turmoil. He wasn't necessarily abandoning wholesale, this concept yeah. of crypto. He wasn't yeah. saying it's not going to work, it's going to collapse. Right. And this really is the reason perhaps we haven't seen more right. contagion because he's not alone. One of the great things we do here is dovetail stories. We really try to make it a tapestry of what you can do and particularly back over 20 years. Credit Suisse is blowing up today. We've reported here on any number of news eyes of money leaving wealth management and that. And you go, well, where did this begin? Lisa alluded to that earlier in the show. Some people will say it began when a young Ken Molas walked out the door rapidly. After CSFB DLJ, a guy named Molas running investment banking waltzed to UBS in a short manner. Sonali Basic picks us up today on what Mr. Mollis is doing this morning. He's all Bitcoin this morning. What is Mr. Mollis doing? It's the truth. You have Mollis and company now hired as an advisor on the Genesis restructuring here. Remember, it's not quite a restructuring yet. This is a company that has been flying around for days looking for money to shore up its lending business. And we like to think about this as crypto, but really it's lending like anything else. It is giving somebody an asset and hoping you get money in return. And so, yes. Right. Mollis so it's Perella hired. Weinberg against Mollis. Is this <laughs> Wall Street finally getting in yes. to Bitcoin or is it just they're, they're finding a fee to get them to 1230? 
31. Uh, we, we joked around in the commercial break. The parents have come home, <laughs> and now Wall Street is stepping in. Perella Weinberg has been hired on FTX. Molis has been hired on the What Genesis are they going to do? What do they actually do? They're trying to sell assets. They're trying to recapitalize the firms as they exist now. You guys were asking yesterday, are, are they being treated like adults here? And the answer is uh, yes, because the adults are now stepping in to each of these firms and trying to recover funds for people who lost real money. The adults have been in the room the whole time trying to profit from it. Let's be very clear. The adults are the <laughs> yeah. ones that possibly have been helping this entire arena stay afloat despite a lot of the skepticism. Yeah. How much are you starting to hear around the edges of uh, investors saying, look, a, the Ken Moses of the world have a lot of stake in this already, right. and B, they're looking for an entry point. I think the point that both of you made, too, is that the restructuring advisors get paid, and that is certainly the truth here. Uh, Molis, in particular, <coughs> was one of the early ones to be very vocal about starting a crypto business, and then that's as they got into restructuring in the crypto business with Voyager and now with, uh, with Genesis as well. Now, you were talking about adults in the room. I was talking to a former Tiger Cub, or Tiger Cub, yesterday. Uh, people are making money now, in crypto. There's a huge arbitrage trade between not just the grayscale Bitcoin trusts, but between Bitcoin futures and spot prices. And there's also shorts being put on other crypto assets as well, including certain stable coins, which may not play out, but if it does, it would play out big. So FTX happened and people talked about the casino closing. Now people are going <laughs> ka-ching and they're still playing in the casino. New casino. A new casino. Is this casino sustainable? Well, it is until it isn't, right? I mean, when you look at Genesis, if you're borrowing from somebody who was not going to exist at the end, potentially, your leverage is mm. gone. So who is the new lender of last resort? I think we you're have not learned me. that yet. You're <laughs> okay. killing me. It's How, the truth. Let's do Drexel Burnham Lambert sure. 101. What's crypto restructuring look like? You, t you go down, the debt goes down to 21 cents on the dollar, you do a restructuring, somebody gets a preferred cash flow, blah, blah, blah. You know this better than me. I don't believe that here if there's no underlying profit, no underlying cash flow. Do Perella Weinberg and Mollis think that there's an underlying cash flow to do a quote unquote restructuring that Peter and Ken did in their ute? To the extent that certain firms have filed for bankruptcy, yes. We know that FTX has more than a billion dollars in cash. They have other assets around the world in terms of certain, they have certain assets that were not included in this bankruptcy. Peter remember. Weinberg is going to do a transaction <laughs> off a, a bungalow in the Bahamas? <gasps> they will go after hard assets, I'm certain. <laughs> but listen, there's another thing to think about here, and it's not just the assets that are at FTX or at Genesis. Remember, the reason over the last couple of days that so much of Wall Street had a hard time stomaching the idea of lending to these businesses as they seek restructuring is because there are a lot of intercompany relationships. One of the things we reported yesterday with Genesis was that, for example, there was an intercompany loan. There, were, uh, there was a promissory note between Digital Currency Group and between Genesis, which was what spooked a lot of investors. They didn't want to get in and then be lower in the capital stack than the folks that have started these businesses in the first place. So it's not just the assets they have, Tom. It's an idea of, okay, if I'm giving these folks more money, do I owe some other guy at the end of the day? How weird is that? So when you talk to your sources, how many of them actually say that there is profound fear, an existential questioning of an asset class that some people say isn't really an asset class, it's a game, it's a theory that got started up during an era of free money. How many people are still talking like that and how many people just accept that this is a staying power kind of place? So... You're, everyone's going to hate me, to your point here. It's not just crypto. Bitcoin has held up. What was your price target, Tom, on Bitcoin again? I, I don't <laughs> have a published price target. If I did, I'd be in the surveillance timeout chair. But on technical... Pharaoh's in it right now, but that's besides... But on technicals, to the extent that even if you thought it went lower, people don't think Bitcoin is crashing. People don't think Ethereum is crashing. If you look at Ethereum guilds, they're still... Shall, it went from 60,000 to 16,000. That's not crashing? It's crashed down, but it's held fairly stable. And the weirdness of it, here's the weirdness of it. You have Kathy Wood saying yesterday that it, she thinks it'll go to a million still. Uh, I talked to Mike Novogratz the other day, who will not not drop his five-year 500,000 target. I know, I saw that. He won't drop it. And so I I don't okay. know how you get there from okay. 16,000. Lisa and I are going to go over and watch the balloons get blown up on the Upper West Side for the Macy's <laughs> Parade. Where are we on Monday? 
Where are we on Monday? To the extent, here's a one important part of the FTX debacle. They won't publish their list of 50 creditors. They won't give names. Why does that matter? Is that because Ken Mollis is on the list? It's because it's a joke, <laughs> folks. Ken, I'm sorry. I had to do it. It's because uh, the list of 50, they've asked for privacy for those creditors in the wake of the bankruptcy hearing. They don't want them to get hacked. They don't want. Oh, come on. This is. Delaware court. Delaware court's going to listen to that? For now, they said. They will revisit the issue in a in a number of weeks at a later hearing. But for now, they won't publish the list, and that's a lot of anger about that. But there is a lot of concern that if those predators were published, <clears throat> that there would be more runs on the bank. And so I know that there are a lot of people chasing down but you with money loss. But you that. assume this is a bank. You just said runs on the bank. Where's the bank? It depends on who. First of all, their lawyers yesterday said it was a run on the bank. The FTX's own okay. lawyers, Fair. Sullivan and Fair. Cromwell, who, you know, history, of history. Um, Sullivan and Cromwell also, right, played such a big role in the They're involved history. here? They sure are, Tom. The, the, Does the Gensler get involved because all these fancy names are getting involved now? They sure are. You think so? <laughs> I, I think everyone would hope so. I think, was that an update? <laughs> that was an update. <laughs> Shelly Bassick with an update there on uh, Weinberg. Well, that'd be a great firm, Perella, Weinberg, Mollis. I mean, you know, they could... Are you creating mercy. banking I'm trying, to, yeah. I'm trying to get a fear to pay for the turkey. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. Bloomberg Surveillance. isn't it just how sensitive the markets are to any commentary about trade we did see some pressure on the yuan we did see some pressure on the futures that is now being reversed so you've got to explain this one to me what does it mean when the white house says we're watching markets carefully it means they have a bloomberg i've seen the bloomberg they have i've been in and seen it lots of bloomberg's lots of bloomberg lots of bloomberg lots of bloomberg lots of i've seen the bloomberg i've seen the bloomberg i've seen What does it mean? What does it mean? What does it mean? It means they have a Bloomberg. Nutrigenomics and precision nutrition is one of those rare scientific fields that overlaps with the Instagram friendly wellness industry. There is a lot of interest in this idea of personalized nutrition and especially how accessible it is to the public. You can go on Google and type personalized nutrition or diet and genes, and you will find dozens of different companies that offer this nutrition precision tests. One of those companies is Routine. Routine claims that their personalized tests stemming from sciences like nutrigenomics make their supplements different. But even with the claims from Routine, as well as dozens of other personalized nutrition companies, the science still has a long way to go. From the world of politics to the world of business, Balance of Power with David Weston brings you news, analysis, and insight from and about politics power players. Balance of Power, weekdays on Bloomberg. No one covers the world like Bloomberg. My team thinks 2023, we avoid a recession. I'm a little more skeptical about that. China and the U.S. both do not want to see nuclear force on the European continent. The regulators here in the Bahamas are ongoing with their investigation into FTX. 
With unmatched reach and resources from more than 120 countries, the moment news breaks 24 hours a day. Bloomberg, your global business authority. What you will do is escape to the airport, drive to Grandma's over the hill and all that. What will we do on a Wednesday of Thanksgiving? It's a data dump at 8.30. We do that with Michael McKee. Mike, a lot of data at this moment. Yes, you cannot uh, have a Thanksgiving holiday without the data dump. And we begin with a very busy morning uh, with durable goods. Durable goods orders up 1%. That's better than the four-tenths anticipated and the four-tenths from the month of September. So good news on the headline. X transportation still strong, up half a percent. It was down half a percent in September. Capital goods orders, non-defense, X air. This is the one the uh, economists watch and the Fed watches. <coughs> business spending, a proxy for business spending, up a strong one, uh, up a strong seven tenths uh, after a four tenths gain, uh, four tenths fall in October. Shipments, which would go into uh, GDP, uh, up 1.3 percent after being being down a half a percent. So business is still spending, and it's going to be interesting later this morning see if the Atlanta Fed uh, GDP now yeah. number comes out. It's been up by about uh, 4 to 4.5 percent. See if it goes higher on those news. Jobless claims, everybody's watching. Here's a jump, 240,000 yep. from 222,000 the prior week. And continuing claims really jump up uh, to 1,551,000 from 1,507,000. Uh, revised, the revision just came in at 1,503,000. But it does show that uh, right. we are seeing people who lose their jobs. Uh, it's taking a little bit longer for them to get jobs. But we're not seeing a right. huge jump in jobless claims that a lot of people were looking for after all the tech layoffs. Well, the market move here on a Wednesday before Thanksgiving, not all that much. But, Mike, I'm going to go uh, introverted here and look at the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index, which you know is going the wrong way for Chairman Powell. With this data, the Bloomberg Financial Conditions Index becomes ever more accommodative. Is this set of reports bad news for the chairman, and is he losing control of the dialogue into the December 14th meeting? Well, I don't think he's losing control, but there's certainly a lot of debate on Wall Street about how far they have to go. The Fed's focused not so much on uh, the economy's growth as it is on the inflation rate. And if inflation comes down and the economy keeps growing, so much the better. That's the soft landing story, so they'll keep an eye on that. But it doesn't help the Fed's story to have financial conditions continue to ease. And when you have numbers like this, that's going to be good for stocks, which is going to put pressure on the financial conditions index, make it uh, go up a little bit, get a little bit looser. Well, meanwhile, we are seeing a little bit of a lift in yields. And this, to me, is interesting because we saw a bigger-than-expected jobless claims figure. Basically, this should be a weaker-than-expected print, which means that it would give perhaps a sense that perhaps the jobs, the job cuts are starting to pick up. Why is that not the case? Is this basically just noisy? at this point and irrelevant um, before we get the real jobs numbers next Friday. Well, it is noisy, and you have a problem during the holidays with jobless claims, seasonally adjusting them because the uh, holidays <laughs> move every year. So I don't think people will pay quite as much attention to the levels as uh, the direction, and the direction is going in the way people thought it would, that we would start to see more jobs uh, lost, more people applying for benefits, but not uh, in huge numbers. There's not been a spurt higher, and that's what uh, I think uh, would really worry investors is uh, right. if we saw that, then they'd anticipate unemployment going up significantly, and then you'd want to start to trade on the idea of a Fed rate cut. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Red and green on the screen, folks. Don't want to oversell it here. It's just a Wednesday churn here looking for direction, but clearly two ten spread, Lisa. we got to take a moment on this, going down to 78 basis points. There it goes. It, it, I've been waiting for what's happening literally right now on the screen, which is we may get curve inversion 
down to 80 basis points. We don't have it yet, but it's in moving in that direction. People gaming out what it could be with 100 basis <coughs> points. Basically, uh, we are seeing resolve, and we will likely see that resolve later on today at 2 p.m. when we get Fed Reserve minutes when they talk about how much they are committed to keeping rates around 5% yeah. or higher. My head's spinning, and more data here uh, through the morning. It's a, it's a huge data dump on a Wednesday. Luke Tilly joins Chief Economist at Wilmington Trust uh, this morning. Luke, do you have a 2023 outlook, or do you have to wait for this data, wait for the inflation data in December, wait for the jobs data, and wait for the Fed meeting before you can develop an outlook? Well, we always have an outlook, and we're expecting uh, a mild recession, just slightly uh, more likely than a soft landing, because it's really challenging, and it comes back down to the inflation data, as you were just talking about with Mike. I think that today's report is really positive for GDP, those capital yep. goods shipments, X-Air, uh, really strong, revised up from the previous month, and that really points to some of those strong GDP numbers. So it's going to come down to inflation and what, how the Fed reacts to all of these numbers and like the labor numbers that you were just discussing. In your work for what I'm going to call a conservative shop, Wilmington Trust idea, folks, a short term is three years, maybe even five years to put things in perspective. Do you see a break in the labor market to accompany inflation concerns? We think that the labor market is obviously still tight. We're seeing that even with the jump in continuing claims that we saw, they're still well below the norms that we would have had pre-pandemic. And I think the market is keying in on that. Uh, on the more positive side, we've seen that decline in job openings. They're still really high. But really, the takeaway here is that wage growth is slowing on a three-month annualized basis down to 3.9%, way down from the heady days last year where it was 6.5%. So we're getting pretty close to normal wage growth, but we still think that there's some upside risk there, and that's really one of the big risks to inflation and why we're a little bit cautious and why we're neutral to equities overall, Tom. So how do you talk about this, Luke, that you see actually the potential for wage growth to reassert itself, but there is clear softening in the labor market, as you point out, uh, with Indeed's uh, metrics as well as others. How do you parse those two? two ideas, softening in a labor market, yet still concern about a wage spiral or sort of wage inflation preeminent, uh, remaining uh, preeminent? Yeah, it's a great question, Lisa. And we're not worried about a wage spiral per se, uh, but the labor market is just like uh, about anything in macro right now, where it used to be really bad, it has definitely improved, but it's not back to normal. And you can almost say that for everything, whether it's inflation or wage growth. And when it comes back to the labor market, we know that a lot of the people who are still missing, quote unquote, from the labor market are permanently retired. And what we really need to see is more people re-entering the labor market that are still in those younger cohorts. We haven't seen that yet. The labor force has been very low, and that could keep the pressure on in wages uh, for firms to deal with. And that's still the upside risk on a, on a longer-term basis, Lisa. When we game out 2023, uh, along with employment, people are looking at the housing market as a tea leaf of how the Federal Reserve is transmitting its policy. And we've already seen mortgage rates go up to 7%, then come down to a lesser high. We have seen softening. How big of a route do you see in the housing market, and how does that trickle out, bleed out into the other areas of the economy that the Fed is trying to affect? Yeah, this is incredibly important because, of course, a house is the largest asset for more, most households. And they've experienced such a run-up in the house price appreciation. And we saw the mortgage numbers still very low, ticked up a little bit this morning. The housing market is going to be key. And what we see people doing now is even though mortgage apps are picking up as the uh, rates have gone down, probably trading down to lower prices, we see the down pressure on prices. Thankfully, compared to 14 years ago or so, people have not been treating their houses like piggy banks with so much home equity. So it's not going to well, damage consumer spending as much. So we're really looking for job growth as the main driver of consumer spending. I could go 20 minutes on this, Luke, and we don't have it. Are you suggesting that housing could be a disinflationary force in the next year? It should be a disinflationary force in the next year, but we know with the data that even once we see the softening in home prices and even in rents, it takes 8 to 12 months for that to play through to the CPI. So even though everybody, including Chair Powell and the FOMC, can see uh, the weakness in those prices, it's going to take a while for, for it to show up in CPI. 
And we still have an inflation problem over the next six months, even though it's going to be decelerating. Look, Tilly, thank you so much for the Wilmington Trust. Lisa Bramowitz on the 210 spread, the vanilla spread, from a negative 76 basis points. We blow through 78 basis points, almost got to 80 points, not quite there yet. The idea that you're getting paid more than 4% to own two-year debt while you're getting paid much less than that to own longer-term debt speaks to the lack of investment incentive in the short term of so many banks and so many companies and you're hearing this on the peripheries, when you talk to executives, they're holding off a little bit on putting stuff out there. And so how much do you start to see that trickling in, uh, in into the economy in a more substantial way? And what does it say about the character of a presumed recession? I think, you know, seriously, into the writing over the weekend, and everybody will publish over the weekend into Monday, what does it say about the recession bet? We heard from Mr. Tilly there some real, not confusion, but uncertainty about what it looks like. Right now, the consensus is a shallow recession. And we keep hearing that, that it's going to be something that's not going to be too deep and that will emerge from it. How much can we actually see that if we are seeing this incredible curve inversion and throwbacks to 1981? We're going to parse through that, not only in the U.S., but also over in Europe. Luca Paolini of Pictet Asset Management, as well as Esti Dweck of Flowbank, uh, is going to be joining us. Yes, Jack Caffrey of J.P. Morgan also uh, weighing in to try to really game out a 2023 of two halves. That seems to be a theme right now. First half being bad, the second one being good. Optimism, rebuild. Thing. Red and green on the screen right now, and the VIX 21.60 showing the good week we've seen in equities. We'll really have to see how this unfolds, I should say, on a Wednesday. Lisa Bramowitz and Tom Keene and John Farrow. We hope that you have a wonderful Thanksgiving. Great to hear from Americans worldwide celebrating in their own uh, way. And it's a Thanksgiving where I guess the heated debate about inflation, as we heard there uh, from Luke Tilly, inflation is tangible. And I go back to OECD earlier this week saying global inflation only gets down to 6.8% out there. Maybe that's not an American story, but... Yes, I think inflation is a Thanksgiving story. The OECD also pointed out this was an energy shock. And how much will this continue to be an energy shock? Jeff Curry, really, with salient points. That's what we saw in the grocery store. Talking about how, well, I mean, this really feeds into everything. And if you get uh, some sort of resurgence in activity, what does that do to the oil shock? Sterling on a path to 120. We heard about that earlier, 119.78 on Sterling. And again, red and green on the screen. Coming up, we are thrilled to bring you Alan Blinder. This is Bloomberg Surveillance. Keeping you up to date with news from around the world with the first word, I'm Lisa Mateo. For the second time in just a few days, there's been a mass shooting in the U.S. This time it took place in Chesapeake, Virginia, where a shooter opened fire in a Walmart Tuesday night. Police say six people were killed, at least five others wounded. The gunman was described as a Walmart employee. Police say they believe he killed himself. The disgraced founder of the collapsed crypto exchange, FTX, has apologized to staff in a letter. Sam Bankman-Fried outlined what he called a crash in collateral from $60 billion to $9 billion. So far, bankruptcy proceedings have depicted FTX as a business with unusual lax documentation and financial controls. The Federal Reserve is set to show how united policymakers were over a higher peak for interest rates than previously signaled. Minutes from this month's meeting are released today. After that meeting, Fed Chair Jerome Powell said that rates would probably rise higher than projections in September had indicated. Jerusalem was rocked by two explosions today, killing one person and wounding at least 14. It was a sharp escalation after months of violence between Israelis and Palestinians. The militant groups Hamas and Islamic Jihad both praised the attacks. The White House condemned the blasts and offered to help Israel, Israel in its investigation. And the world's largest maker of agricultural machinery expects profit to surge to a record next year. Deere is projecting net income for the fiscal year that beat Wall Street estimates. And that's after posting better than expected fourth quarter earnings. Deere has benefited from the rise in farmers' incomes. Global News, 24 hours a day on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than 120 countries. I'm Lisa Mateo. This is Bloomberg.
We had a long-standing presence here in, in Houston for the past, I would say, 20-some years since the compact merger. We bought a piece of land, we started building this building. And uh, in doing so, we had to also recalibrate how we were building it because the pandemic hit us. And we thought about recreating a work environment that is very, very different, that is catered for this new structural way of working, which we call Edge to Office, where people don't always come to the office to work, can work remotely from their homes, their edges, but have to come back to the office for specific reasons, such as uh, team meetings, customer meetings, and in general collaboration. With regards to the hybrid work model, do you see that some, as, as something that will persist longer term when the pandemic is long gone? Yes, no question, this will persist. And I think we are witnessing right now a societal change in the way we work. You're no longer going to measure productivity in the same way as in the past. You're going to be focusing on outputs. Never mind what people do in their private times. It doesn't really matter to a company as long as the output is there. HPE launched its Edge to Office hybrid work initiative in the fall of 2020. The new campus is designed with that flexible model in mind. Material samples brought back from objects in space can shed light on billions of years of our solar system's history, including details about the origin of life here on Earth. A piece of an asteroid is a, a piece of the earliest beginnings of a solar system. But picking up rocks from the surface of an asteroid or planetary satellite isn't as easy as it sounds. It requires voyages of millions of miles to bodies that have never been seen up close. Probes need to land on surfaces with weak gravitational pulls, where the surface terrain is completely unknown, gather samples, and then make the long trip back. And while behemoths like NASA and SpaceX grab right. headlines, it's a relatively young space agency. The Japan Aerospace Exploration Agency, better known as JAXA, that is taking the giant leap necessary to bring the mysteries of space back down to Earth. restoring price stability remains the number one focus of the FOMC, and we're committed to using our tools to put inflation on a sustainable downward trajectory to 2%. The mathematician from Cleveland, Loretta Mester, exceptionally qualified to comment on your American economy. She is the Federal Reserve Bank of Cleveland uh, president. This is a joy, and as we all migrate over the river and through the woods, it is important to understand that Blinder of Princeton will grace the door of grandchildren. We speak to him before he celebrates Thanksgiving. He is the former vice chairman of the Fed and, of course, always and forever with his Princeton University. Alan Blinder, your book is wildly accessible. To review, folks, there is Milton Friedman and Anna Schwartz, a thousand pages, maybe 800 pages. There's Alan Meltzer, 3,000 pages. This is, whatever your politics, the readable book of 400 pages on a monetary and fiscal history of the United States. Alan, how did you keep the book so short? What did you have to do to keep it under 500 pages? Well, it's, a, it's, a, it's a very fair question. I think what you have to do is be the editor-in-chief. Uh, I do not have every detail that you could imagine. You know, if you read, look at Alan Meltzer's book, you can almost go FOMC meeting by FOMC meeting and see what everybody said. You, uh, sad, I, don't, I was going to say sadly. I don't think it's sadly. You don't find that here. But you do find uh, the basic storyline of what was going on with monetary policy and fiscal policy, by the way. And what were the big issues of the day and how were they resolved? And sort of where we think right. we have answers well, those good decisions or bad decisions. To, to me, the singular distinction right now is your chapter 14, where you say 
all together now. It was unthinkable for Alan Greenspan to comment on the dollar. And with the various crises, the once in a lifetime crises we've enjoyed, we now have a Fed in bed with the Treasury talking about the dollar and, and frankly, social policy as well. Where do we go from our present all together now? Well, I think in time, this is not happening right away, but in time, you're going to see more of a separation between the Fed and the Treasury, in that sense, back towards the traditional uh, uh, system, in the, at least in the United States, not around the world, by the way, but in the, uh, in the United States. The, pa the pandemic crisis just insisted that the Treasury and the Fed, um, you know, snuggle up together. Well, that's a, that's a bad metaphor. <laughs> Work towards the same goals, really. And, it, right. and not have any distance showing between the right. two of them. There were uh, liquidity facilities that the Fed created, lending facilities that the Fed created, backstopped by the Treasury. That kind of cooperation was dictated by the circumstances. Hopefully, we all think we're going to get back right. to normal. Well, back to normal was Vice Chairman Blinder speaking, and white smoke came out of the chimney in advance to let people know what was going to be said. Is there too much Fed speak today, Alan? I don't think so. I mean, an elusive but reasonable goal, but it's elusive, <clears throat> uh, is to get the Fed speaking with one voice. That's not so easy when there are 19 members on the FOMC, but it's not been too bad. I mean, there are other committees around the world that are speaking with many more conflicting voices than the FOMC uh, does. But, you know, my view, people have often criticized the uh, tendency to speak too much. And my view is if you've confused people by speaking too much, say more so they're not confused anymore. And by the way, without, without any advice from me, Jay Powell does that. When he right. sees that the markets and other people are getting it wrong, he speaks up again to help them get it right. Alan Black and others, including Vice Chairman Brainerd, try to speak in a safe manner, getting out to an ex post reality where they can react. The financial media, and frankly, much of Wall Street, is now in a parlor game of futures, trying to find not only the path up to a terminal rate, but then to game a pivot to a more accommodative stance. You and I have right. never seen this. How do we extricate ourselves from this silliness? Well, I think you, the Fed will extricate itself uh, from, by, by its actions and its words. Remember the Jackson Hole speech of uh, Chair Powell. The whole purpose of that was to shake out of the market's heads the notion that this would be a quick peak in the Fed funds rate, and then it would start coming down right away. I mean, he said very, he made it very clear that that was not going to happen, and we don't think that's going to uh, happen either. Uh, we're not going to get rid of the constant, incessant drumbeat of disparate chatter about the Fed coming out of market people. You know, that's their constitutional right, uh, so to speak, and they will say what they say, but. The clever people will keep their eye on the ball and uh, and right. filter through a lot of that noise and pay attention to what's really coming out of the Fed's mouth. And that mainly means the Fed chairman's mouth. Alan Blinder, one final question on your majesty of 40, 50, 60 years of Fed policy. There's the unknown unknowns out there like Dr. Alarian would speak of. And one of the great unknowns, thinking of the laureate Paul Romer, is the effect of technology on Alan Blinder's economy. Do we actually really know what technology is doing to us right now? We most definitively don't. Uh, one of the things, you know, e economists aren't that great at forecasting, period. But one of the things we really cannot forecast, and it's not just us, nobody can forecast to your question, is the sort of changes in the long run trend of productivity. These things happen now and then, not every year, not every two years. But they do happen, and they almost always hit us by surprise. And in some cases, even looking back over years or decades, we don't still don't understand quite what in the world happened. You know, the 90, 1995 acceleration of productivity, I think we understand that it had to do with companies learning how to use all those computers they had hanging around. 
but the 1973 plus slowdown, we still don't understand. Here we are in the year 2022, and you know productivity growth just slowed down, and we don't know why. I, I, I will not mince words, folks. Checking it at under 500 pages, a monetary and fiscal history of the United States from a time of John F. Kennedy is without question the most readable Fed history I've seen, of course, from Alan Blinder of Princeton University. Alan, thank you so much for joining us uh, before dinner with said grandchildren. Uh, futures are negative four, Dow futures are negative uh, 48. Lots going on. I really want to, we underplayed this this morning. Lisa and I have been so busy with the news. Jeffrey Curry of Goldman Sachs was really something about down $3.00. American oil, 78.19 a barrel, and the idea of Brent crude, $85.30, down from the 90 level of just a number of uh, days ago. He is heated with d dynamics in demand and dynamics in supply that we could revisit $100 a barrel or even higher. Boy, would that change the debate as well. Please stay with us. An important conversation with David Weston. This is with Mr. Clyburn. He is a Democrat. Uh, with Nancy Pelosi. That'll be a timely conversation on Balance of Power, 12 noon. Have a great Thanksgiving. There's an incoming revolution on the high seas that isn't quite as sexy, but could be significantly more impactful. Container shipping is the key component of global trade. About 80 or 90 percent of all the world's goods are transported at sea at some point. But there's a significant unseen cost to the modern era of global commerce. About 3 percent of all the world's CO2 emissions come from shipping. 3 percent may not sound like a lot. But that's roughly comparable to the entire CO2 output of Germany. Since reducing trade isn't a likely option, what about a technological improvement to help reduce the emissions from these well-stocked maritime behemoths? legislation that was really a tectonic shift for this white house the theory of this bill as i understand it is there'll be a multiplier effect how did democrats mobilize specifically younger voters bringing you the political news you need to know the president has made it very clear that this is a significant focus for the intersection of wall street and washington nobody covers politics like bloomberg
City for our viewers worldwide. I'm Lisa Abram was in for Jonathan Farrow. Markets range bound ahead of the Thanksgiving holiday tomorrow, fluctuating between gains and losses. Yields slightly higher. The countdown to the open starts right now. Everything you need to get set for the start of U.S. trading. This is Bloomberg The Open with Jonathan Farrow. big issue, reading the December tea leaves. Fed speakers on a daily basis sending some kind of a, uh, confusing messages. Market becoming a little bit more cautious on its expectations for the Fed. We know they're going to raise rates 50 basis points. 50 basis points in December. How prepared the markets for a slowing of, uh, of rate hikes. Waiting for that moment when the Fed is likely to, to pivot. The terminal rate exploration process. Are we there yet? Are we there yet? Are we there yet? We think they're about 70 to 80 percent done with the tightening cycle. They're pushing back against the easing in financial conditions. Keenly focused on the labor market. They know that policy works with long and variable labs, lags. They are going into restrictive territory. Now they is going to continue damaging growth. The one consistent message from the Fed, there is going to be pain. Joining us now to discuss is Flow Banks, SD Dweck, and Luca Paolini of Picte Asset Management. And I do want to get to both of you on the year ahead, but just in the here and now, SD, how important are today's meeting minutes from the November 2nd Fed Confab? I think they're not that important. There's going to be some attention to the dot plot and any discuss well, to discussion of the dot plot and whether that terminal rate is going to come in higher when we get the next update in December. But we've had so many Fed speakers uh, come out since the meeting with very hawkish or mostly hawkish comments. We know there was a slightly more dovish meeting and a more hawkish Powell press conference. I think at this point, investors are looking at it because it's the last big data before the Thanksgiving weekend. But I don't think we're going to get that many big surprises from today. Luca, it seems like SD is not alone. A lot of people kind of shrugging past this, perhaps because they don't want to look at it ahead of the uh, long weekend. But are we moving past the Federal Reserve as a controller of markets? Are we moving past the central banks as having some sort of prescience and moving toward the data, the granularity of each individual investor in their thesis? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree. I think when we look at the what central banks are uh, planning to do. I think we know very well what they're planning to do. I think now we have reached a point, especially in the U.S., where interest rates are pretty much in line with where I think they should be. So now more than ever is about growth, especially it's about inflation, and, and also it's about inflation expectations. But I think we have reached a point where interest rates, again, are more or less in line with fundamentals. So now it's about data more than ever, and I think what the minutes may actually tell us if the Federal Reserve members feel more worried or less worried about growth than, than the markets uh, think. And there's an issue as we look at how the market is pricing in terms of rate hikes, in terms of uh, the Fed stopping at 5%. Evercore's Krishna Guha focusing on that, writing, quote, we think the Fed leadership wants to get off the 75 basis point of meeting hamster wheel, even though it is finding it hard to do so while maintaining control of financial conditions. We think the Fed is still heading for a hawkish slowing, and the slowing part is what matters. I wonder, SD, from your vantage point, whether we're really looking at something that is going to be hawkish no matter what, and a market that is eased in terms of financial conditions far beyond what the Fed would like to see. I think they need to stay hawkish, and their next challenge is going to be one saying that tightening is still tightening, even if it's not 75 basis points per meeting, and that four and a half, four seventy-five, five percent, wherever they end up is restrictive monetary policy. This higher for longer is restrictive. And to try to maintain that hawkish tone to keep those medium to long term inflation expectations anchored, prevent those financial conditions from loosening too much. Because if that happens, then they're forced to come back and hike some more. So at this point, I think it's more about a balancing act of maintaining that hawkish rhetoric those inflation expectations in check and those financial conditions relatively tight and having that restrictive monetary policy than actually what the rate hike is looking like.
Right, sort of targeting an S&P uh, level. I'm not saying that uh, specifically. It's sort of tongue-in-cheek. But is it? Luca, I mean, how much are you looking at the, uh, the financial conditions easing in response to this expectation of a slowing inflation and think that the Fed's going to push back and push back hard? Well, I do believe that when you look at financial conditions, they're probably going to get a little bit more, a little bit tighter. But I think what really matters for financial conditions is the direction of inflation. And inflation, uh, in my opinion, is going to go down quite significantly. This would help, will help multiples to go higher, so valuation for equity will improve. The real question is that if earnings will decline much more than the PE will rise because of uh, basically a pause by the Fed, also falling inflation. And I think the jury on this is still out. I still believe that earnings will fall quite significantly next year. So I think the Fed really needs to pause for markets to go higher. And I believe that it's too early to make this call. And that's why we continue to be uh, quite cautious on equities, and especially after the rally that we have seen in the past few weeks. We'll dig into that in just a bit. Oh, just sticking on the Fed speak, we've been digesting a bunch of it, including Kansas City Fed President Esther George, highlighting the need for higher rates. While high savings is likely to provide momentum to consumption and require higher interest rates, it's certainly positive that we see that these households are wealthier, less financially constrained, and better insured. But that said, reduced inflation will mean we have to incent saving over consumption. Michael McKee joining us now with more from Washington, D.C. Michael, ahead of those meeting minutes, what are you looking at? What is going to be important for you? Well, I think Esty Dweck put it well that there isn't much we're going to learn in here. However, the meeting minutes are put together and edited after the meeting, uh, and they have three weeks. And I think what you may see is a bit of a hawkish tilt trying to keep a lid on the financial conditions out there. But here's what we already know. Uh, Jay Powell told us the decision was unanimous. The terminal rate was likely to be raised. Uh, it may be time to slow the pace. And many feel rates are going to be higher for longer. So there's not going to be any real surprises in there, I don't think, that the chairman and everyone else who's spoken since then hasn't already told us. Now, we are seeing some confusion in the markets about where we go from here. When you look at what the market is pricing for Fed fund futures, it looks like there's a big drop in uh, interest rates, big cuts coming next year. But really, those are about 10 basis points at a time. You don't really get a full 25 basis point cut until November. So it may be that the Fed's message is beginning to sink in. We'll have to see. Uh, finally, how important are the minutes and how important is all this Fed speak? Well, Alan Blinder was just on Bloomberg Television saying that he doesn't think the Fed is hurting anybody by talking as much as it does, even though they got a lot of criticism for it. I just want to take you back to when this all started. The first statement from the Fed was on February 4th of 1994. Alan Greenspan put out a statement, and ever since then, the Fed's been communicating a lot more. And look what's happened to the S&P 500. Doesn't look like investors have really been hurt by all this Fed speak. Yeah, not yet anyway. Michael McKee, thank you so much. Meanwhile, we are getting some PMIs in the United States later this hour uh, following some results out of the Euro region. S&P Global saying, quote, it's clear that manufacturing remains in a severe downturn and the service sector is still under intense pressure. A recession therefore looks likely, though the latest data provides hope that the scale of the downturn may not be as severe as previously feared. Still with us, Esti Dweck and Luca Paolini. So over in London, Luca, from your vantage point, we saw better than expected data. How consistent is this with the message in Europe over the next six months, 12 months, that perhaps this recession won't be as deep and can be uh, sort of emerged from more quickly? Well, let me say there is a huge consensus about the recession in Europe. When there is a huge consensus, normally the consensus tends to be wrong. I think, to be fair, though, the risk of recession is very high. But having said that, we see also the consumer confidence, confidence data has been improving recently. The economic data is more resilient than everybody expects. And I think for a combination of factors, I think the one is the natural gas prices are going down, which is very significant. You also see a quite, quite substantial fiscal policy response. Uh, and uh, like in the U.S., I think there are still excess savings in the system. So I do believe that Europe will go through a recession, but I think it's not going to be particularly severe. It's not going to be particularly long. Uh, and the market, I think, slowly 
is uh, recognized this fact, and uh, European equities has been uh, doing pretty well in the last few weeks because of these reasons. Essie, do you agree, and do you think that that has staying power? I, I agree that uh, some of these factors have certainly helped uh, European equities to do well in the last few weeks. I'm not sure it has so much staying power. We know that growth is going to soften even further, even though uh, so far the, the winter has been relatively mild and those gas storage levels are much better. I think uh, the, the lower gas prices were the real catalyst for that upside in equity prices. We still don't know what the ECB uh, is going to do and how it's going to balance this softer growth backdrop with extremely high inflation. So I do worry more about European equities uh, looking into next year. But in the short term, earnings have been relatively supportive, and we do have a little bit of that momentum still going for European equities, at least into the next couple of weeks. Well, there's momentum for everything right now, SD. I mean, how much do you buy into this idea that this risk rally can last until the end of the year? I mean, I understand all the gloom and doom uh, beyond, but people are saying, look, people want to make their performance. They're going to be buying, and that's what we're seeing right now. I think that is what we're seeing, and we're going to continue to have that momentum into the end of the year. We have a couple of very important data points and quite a few sort of soft and hard inflation data points over the next three weeks, uh, and that can really help the market. If disinflation indicators continue to feed through into the harder data, that's going to make the job of the Fed a lot easier to at least lift their foot off the pedal somewhat, reduce those uh, the pace of the rate hikes or at least the size of the rate hikes, and I think it'll continue. Now, uh, as Luca was saying, we have an earnings question for next year. We have those lagged effects from all of that tightening we've done this year, uh, looking at what it's going to do to growth next year. So a couple of big question marks later in 2023, but for the next few weeks, even if it's not in a straight line up, I do think that momentum is going to continue into uh, into Christmas. Luca, final word? Well, I do believe, though, when you look at the equity market, I think there is too much of a, of a kind of optimism about inflation, about a central bank pausing. So I do believe that the, the next big move is not going to be up and it's going to be down. And I have to say that uh, our hopes are all in inflation fully. And again, we see some evidence of that, but it's too early really to make this call. So I still believe that it's better to be a little bit cautious to be uh, overweight defensives, and so we don't believe that this rally uh, is really uh, can be sustained for the next three or six months. Luca Paolini, SD Dweck, both of you are sticking with us, taking a look right now at some of the stocks that are moving ahead of the opening bell. Here's Abigail Dillil. Well, Abby. Lisa, futures may be stuck right around flat or down slightly right now, but we've got some bigger movers beneath the surface, beginning with earnings movers. Earnings are continuing to come in. Nordstrom, the shares are down about 8%. This after the company reported disappointing earnings. Uh, there was too much inventory, too many sales needed, price cutting, uh, plus the current quarter, the holiday quarter, uh, is starting off relatively slow. Autodesk down 8.8 percent. Uh, this after their billings were pretty light. The outlook was cut and it seems like customers are reluctant to lock up for more than a year. Now if we flip up the board and take a look at some of the interesting um, non sequitur movers that are to the upside. Tesla up nearly 2 percent on an upgrade over at City on a better risk to reward after the big fall. While Adam Jonas over at Morgan Stanley used to be a big Tesla bull bear. Now he is saying that this is a big value opportunity. In NVIDIA, the chips continued to extend to some degree, a small degree, yesterday's rally. And then Manchester United, a big story stock, up 9.1 percent on the news, sort of news, Lisa, because there were uh, trickles of this uh, a couple months ago that the Glazer family may be considering selling its entire stake or a piece of the stake. So that stock up again, 9 percent. Abigail, thank you so much. Coming up, disruptions and layoffs continuing in the labor market. In terms of what's happening on the ground, if you think about labor, if you think about housing, all of those things are showing signs of easing at this point. Credit Suisse, HP, now joining the growing list of companies announcing some of those cuts. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg.
reports has stories about what they call black soot caused by the manufacturing and consumption of these fuel products in the illegal refineries. Oil theft, known as bunkering, and the refining of its spoils is worsening the damage from decades of fossil fuel exploitation, creating one of the world's most severe ecological disasters. Our sacred forests, our homes, have to give way to oil wells. And no one gets much benefit. Imagine a resident of Potako who inhales this suit every second in 24 hours, seven days a week, 30 days in the month, and for years now, we are dying slowly but surely, and our lifespan is reducing every day. seeing the beginnings of layoffs, you know, particularly tech firms and also in the financial industry, uh, fairly large numbers. And that, in time, will be reflected in consumer demand, I think, in next year, particularly discretionary demand. More layoff announcements coming in across industries. HP planning to cut 6,000 jobs. Credit Suisse slashing at least a third of its investment banking staff in China. Meanwhile, a protest erupting at Apple's main iPhone plant in China as tensions rise over unpaid wages and tough COVID restrictions. Team coverage starting right now. Shanali Vasek, Katie Greifeld. Uh, let's start with you, Shanali. What we've seen, what are you seeing? With Credit Suisse, we know about those job cuts in China, but remember they also issued that profit warning. That profit would be falling. They would be posting a loss of more than 1.5 billion dollars, 1.5 billion Swiss francs. So we do have shares here under pressure in Switzerland. They are trading below four bucks, so certainly a, a scary level to see for a Swiss bank, any large global systemic bank. But again, remember, that profit is not as steep as it was the last quarter. What we're hearing from Credit Suisse is them acknowledging the previously reported extent of outflows at its wealth management business. In addition to that, they, they put the scale to it, but they also said that investment banking is further under pressure than initially thought. And beyond those seasonal declines, so you do have an array of problems. You do have J.P. Morgan analysts also saying that the fund outflows in particular, Lisa, are concerning. And Credit Suisse, as we know, after the most recent decisions by S&P and uh, the credit rating under pressure here, that they would be facing outflows in that kind of a scenario. But we are learning just how much here this bank is not yet out of the woods. Shanali, thank you so much. And Katie, uh, we're seeing that pain broaden out. What is uh, going on in your space? It's broadening out. It's also especially intensifying in the tech sector. You mentioned HP. It cut its earnings outlook, but it also announced plans to cut up to 10 percent of its workforce. That does amount to about 6,000 jobs over the next three years or so. And they're not alone. You have fintech giant FIS also planning to gradually lay off thousands of workers. That's part of a plan to cut about $500 million of costs in the coming quarter. And of course, Google parent company Alphabet, too, is reportedly preparing to lay off about 10,000 of its, quote, poor performing employees. So uh, just a trio of bad news there. But if you look at how some of these stocks are performing pre-market, HP, it seems as if shareholders are cheering those cost-cutting efforts. You have Alphabet shares a little bit higher here. And Apple, as you mentioned, Lisa, dealing with protests at its main iPhone plant in China down a little bit pre-market. And we're talking about tech here, but this is a narrative running through the entire economy right now. You're looking at Challenger US job cuts announcements. Obvious, obviously, the 2020 bars there kind of blow it out of the water. But as you can see, those bars are creeping higher and higher, Lisa. Thank you so much. Katie Reifeld, Chanali Basik, both of you, great work. Uh, Esti Dweck and Luca Paolini back with us. Luca, from your vantage point, as you see some of these layoffs, is it enough of a softening to really take some of the inflationary pressure out? Do you reward companies that do cut back to prepare for perhaps a tougher next year? Well, I do see some evidence that wage growth is moderating, which I think is in line with the fact that 
final demand is, is weaker than, than probably than expected. I don't see the risk of a significant decline or an acceleration in job cuts, to, uh, to be honest, because the service sector remains very, very solid. But it's no question that companies are making much less money than before. Um, final demand or the, the uncertainty about final demand is increasing. So it seems to be uh, a pretty easy call to, uh, to make that uh, job growth will decelerate quite significantly. And I think what will be an impact on inflation? Well, it's difficult to say because inflation is about wage growth but also margins. So I think that inflation will continue to fall but not probably by as much as the market expects. Meanwhile, uh, we do wonder, SD, about some of the areas that have already gotten pretty beaten up, have already seen pretty broad layoffs, and I'm thinking about retail. Are there areas where you've already seen such huge declines that they're starting to seem a little bit more attractive? Well, you mentioned retail for sure. Uh, we're starting to see that come through a little bit across in the tech sector. Still a lot of work to do because the announcements are just coming, but I think at some point we are going to see uh, investors give the benefit of the doubt to these companies. I think we're going to see better earnings over the next few quarters, and the fact that that cost uh, costs are being reined in is certainly going to be seen as a positive. As uh, Luca was saying, when you look at the service sector, you still have a lot of demand for jobs. So we're not going to see these layoffs across uh, every sector. And I think, broadly speaking, for the unemployment rate and for the the labor market, I think it will prove more resilient. Uh, maybe than the Fed would like, but then uh, some of these expectations that we have. We talked about uh, those excess savings still coming through and helping people. So we're starting to go in that direction, but overly cutting won't necessarily be the answer, especially if we manage to have something of a short and mild recession. So, Esty, it seems like that is your base case. You said you ended there with short-lived uh, kind of recession. Is that the base case for you, that we're going to avoid some sort of incredibly hard landing? At this point, it still seems like a possibility. So base case is a strong word, but if the Fed does uh, lay off a little bit and reduce these uh, rate hikes and we're coming closer to that terminal rate around 5%, I think that's perfectly manageable for the economy. We're certainly going to see a slowdown, but the labor market uh, is quite strong. As I said, those savings are doing pretty well. And now we are seeing improvement in the inflation picture, in the supply chain, and that suggests that, you know, things can pick up and the Fed will be able uh, to at least pause at some point. We're not talking about a pivot here, but that should help growth have a, a softer landing than uh, what's priced in. Luca, final word? Well, I think that the uh, the most indicators point to a potentially long period of stagnation more than recession. I don't know if it's uh, better or worse for, for markets, but I don't see a big decline in, in, in GDP for a very simple reason, because uh, corporation, but also the consumer sector is now over leveraged. So I see the risk of a period of stagnation with growth around zero for three or four quarters, but I don't see the risk or, or significant risk of a deep recession in the U.S. in the coming quarters. Luca Paolini, uh, S.T. Dweck, both of you, uh, thank you so much. Have a wonderful weekend if you're taking off starting tomorrow. Coming up, the morning calls and later, J.P. Morgan's Jack Caffrey urging investors to remain disciplined with diversified portfolios to navigate the volatility. That conversation is still ahead on a day with not a lot of action. Markets pretty much flat here uh, with just about seven minutes to go to the open. This is Bloomberg. Imagine simply climbing a cable into space. The concept is known as the space elevator. Not only could it significantly change how we leave planet Earth, but it could also completely transform humanity's relationship with space. And there are scientists 
to think we could have already built it. We have the material, we have the technology, we have the lasers, we have the climbers, we have all of it. If a private entity wants to build it, or a government, they can build it. It'll change society. We have no clue how colonizing into space, how really spreading out into space will really change our society over the next 50 to 200 years. It'll be completely different. Technology is there with the news and analysis you need. Every weekday, only on Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Rockets, the open. Time now for our morning calls. A look at some of the analyst recommendations on Wall Street this morning. First up, Argus upgrading Yum brands to buy. Expecting sales to accelerate with consumers opting for cheaper menu options. Next up, Bank of America upgrading Warner Music to neutral, staying, uh, saying the company now has multiple catalysts to fuel a future streaming growth. And finally, Citigroup upgrading Tesla to neutral, seeing a more balanced risk reward following the stock's 50% decline this year. Right now in markets, you're seeing a pretty much range-bound kind of feel, a very much pre-markets, fluctuating between gains and losses. Although the S&P, uh, we have seen uh, pretty much get steady after a we are of pretty steady losses uh, over the past couple of weeks. We also have seen a deep inversion, and this is what I'm focused on, the 210 spread, the gap between two-year and 10-year Treasury yields, the most negative going back to 1981, 79 basis points of inversion. Coming up, J.P. Morgan's Jack Caffrey will be speaking with him about the year ahead. From New York, this is Bloomberg. satellites have propulsion systems they can kind of move to get out of the way of each other or, or change their orbit a little bit it's a service that you guys offer to help these companies know how to maneuver their machines yeah we offer a collision avoidance service it's a subscription service we'll send you an alert up to seven days in advance if your satellite's going to come dangerously close to a piece of debris or another satellite companies have been doing that for decades moving satellites around but it's it's sort of like a harder problem now the risk of a collision is a lot higher now just because we've installed so much more hardware into space you have a big collision it creates a cloud of debris and now all the other satellites are flying through this whizzing mess uh, of debris as we add all of the new satellites into space the risks of the collision the likelihood of the collision is going up Top names in climate change are on Bloomberg. Building out local wind, local solar, hydrogen. These are solutions to not just climate issues, but geopolitical issues. We are in a position by 2030 to have 80% of all electricity generated by wind. Renewables are the safest, uh, the cleanest, and the cheapest form of energy today, especially for countries such as Greece. Nobody covers climate change like Bloomberg, your global business authority. You will shed light on dark matter. You will make aging optional. Because when you subscribe to Bloomberg, you won't just get news. You will get insight into limitless possibilities. Before you change the world, Bloomberg.
Macy's Day Parade ringing the New York Stock Exchange bell. This is Countdown to the Open. I'm Lisa Abramowitz in for Jonathan Farrow. Moments away from the start of trading with markets that are not doing very much. You're seeing the Nasdaq flat, S&P down about a tenth of a percent. Yields just slightly higher as people parse through some data. On a data dump kind of day, we are getting a slew of data before the long weekend, including at 10 a.m. University of Michigan consumer sentiment data. We did get a, a little bit higher than expected jobless claims earlier and also durable goods orders coming in strong, showing sustained uh, demand in an economy that has been parked by its resilience dollar a little bit weaker, 103.30 on the euro dollar and crude below $80 on the uh, WTI, the NYMEX, $78.29. Joining us now with a look at the stocks moving at the opening bell, here's Abigail Doolittle. Lisa, let's take a look at the shares of Deer because they are popping on a strong quarter. The company also boosted uh, the outlook, investors liking this a lot, looking like the best day in about six months. And it looks like high tractor sales were really uh, what uh, spurred the quarter that was a strong quarter along with the outlook. As for what's dragging, because we do, of course, have uh, stocks, well, basically just flat here. Uh, let's take a look at Credit Suisse, which is down 2.2%. Shanali earlier was talking about those layoffs, but they also had uh, um, the fact that their assets outflow, there were outflows of $88 billion, and they're looking at the possibility of a $1.6 billion uh, loss coming up. So more bad news for Credit Suisse. And then oil down on the day, as you know, WTI crude back below $80 per barrel, as you were just pointing out, dragging on the energy sector. And this has everything to do with the EU discussing that Russia price cap at $65 to $70, not enough to uh, perhaps uh, stem the the lack of sales uh, to that Russia oil. So again, oil is down, taking the energy sector with it, Lisa. Abigail, thank you so much. The retail rally, meanwhile, taking a breather following yesterday's monster move higher. Better than expected results fueling a rally across the sector. Burlington Stores recording its best day in over nine years. Best Buy jumping nearly 13 percent, making it the S&P 500's top performer on Tuesday. Joining us now is Bloomberg's Katie Greifeld. Katie, kind of revived from the dead, huh? A little bit so. Retail, it's really emerged as an unlikely bright spot this earnings season. Like we just talked about, you had Burlington, Best Buy, Abercrombie, all handily beating their analyst forecasts. Add that together and an index of apparel retailers at the highest level since about January. And most of those gains coming in November alone as we head into a key holiday season. But as with everything these days, you have to adjust for inflation. And when you do that, Holiday shopping is actually expected to post its first real loss since 2009. We're talking about a decline of about 1.2%, so keep an eye out for that. And we'll talk about some of the outperformers, but let's end with some bad news. Nordstrom cut its profit forecast by 12% last night. That's all about markdowns to clear out that excess inventory, which is up 20% from the second quarter. If you look at shares right now, Lisa, they're down about, oh, 8% as trading kicks off. Thank you so much. Katie Greifeld uh, there. Uh, Jack Caffrey of J.P. Morgan arguing that investors are getting ahead of the economy, writing, quote, the economic reality is moving so much more slowly than traders' op op opinions. It seems much more likely that we have a recession next year, given the host of factors we are seeing that have occurred prior to a recession in the past. We talked about the yield curve before. I'm so pleased to say Jack Caffrey joining us now. Jack, I love this because we have all these people saying, yeah, it might be bad, but it's going to be really good after that, so let's just trade right ahead to that. Where are we seeing uh, markets' opinions getting perhaps ahead of the reality? Well, I think you started talking about it a moment ago to some extent with retail. Um, you know, retail does tend to be an early cycle mover. We do know that there should be you know, more people back to work, so probably more people back to office, I should say. Um, but you have this underpinning of where are inventories and where should inventories be. When you just mentioned Nordstrom's a week plus ago, we had details from Target in terms of some people just have still too much out there. Uh, looking at some of the bounces in some of the housing stocks, again, you know, early cycle moves, even ahead of interest rates seemingly stabilizing and actually getting the indication that costs of some of those big ticket items, uh, housing and possibly even the auto sector, uh, getting a little bit too far ahead of themselves before you've actually Connection seen them lost. So, Jack, how much is what you're saying a, a sort of reflection of pain that has not yet been realized on the balance sheets of these companies and their forward-looking outlooks? And how much is just, just a, a valuation reset in the new era that we're in of inflation and real yield? Well, I, I think there are two parts there. And if I were to start with the valuation question, certainly equities have been pressured 
from a reset to higher interest rates. I think there's been some repricing of a certainty in the Federal Reserve that lasted from the immediate aftermath of the global financial crisis up until maybe late last year, uh, when the Fed insisted that inflation be transitory and then more or less said, oops, maybe we were wrong. Uh, and as they try to recapture that, I think investors are embedding some risk premium for is the Fed trying to offer forward guidance through the rear view mirror. Now, what the equity market still has to work through is you know, what is the earnings impact? And I think that's where the questions get more interesting because you have some questions that bad inventory. We've seen that. That's been flushing its way through the system and somewhat noisily in the equity market. But importantly, a lot of companies have been talking so much about they've worked so hard to hire people that they intend to keep them. And I think that might be supportive of sales, but also might pressure margins. And to the extent that equity investors rely on companies to really guide them towards what the sales of the earnings, sales and earnings outlook looks like, you know, we might have a better sales outcome, certainly supported by inflation, as we were just talking about. Uh, but at the same time, are the profits going to be there as, as certainly as we would have thought in the past if companies are a bit slower to flex that layoff muscle? That's such an important point and something we keep hearing about, the job full recession. What is the consequence to margins if that is truly the belief? Meanwhile, sentiment on Wall Street looking ahead to the second half of 2023, as uh, Jack was talking about, analysts seeing the S&P 500 index profits shrinking until then. After that, well, Bloomberg's Kaylee Lyons joining us now. Kaylee. Well, if you listen to Michael Hartnett over at Bank of America, Lisa, he says don't touch risk assets at least in the first half of next year, and then maybe things get a little bit better as we reach a narrative of peacockish no more uh, climbing bond yields or the dollar or Fed funds, and then there will genuinely be a bullish turn, which, of course, is not what we have seen in the equity markets this year. And he is not alone in that view. You had a similar view being echoed over at Credit Suisse as well as Bank of America, which sees a bottom coming in in the first half. And where that leaves us is really with a tale of two different six-month periods in 2023 and ultimately a year-end target on average on the street that is just shy of where we trade this morning. 39.31 is the average, and even only only 5.5% upside from uh, the yesterday's close for the high on the street. So not too much upside is seen next year. And, of course, a big part of that story is not just about price. It's about earnings as well, which is what you two were just discussing. If you look at the earnings growth estimates per quarter next year, it is expected to be soft in the first half, actually down about half of 1% when it comes to S&P EPS growth in the second quarter, but then a big rebound seen coming in Qs 3 and 4, and that is likely what all these strategists are looking forward to, Lisa. Kavi Lyons, thank you so much. And, of course, it's Jack Haffrey, who's still with us. Uh, I was saying that perhaps people are getting a little ahead of themselves. Do you think that it's because the path to the second half, the more optimism that we're expecting later in 2023, is perhaps a little pre premature based on it's hard to know what's going to happen in the first half and whether the pain will truly be realized there. I, I do think to some extent that we've seen, you know, if we go down the balance sheet, the, the fixed income markets have certainly been much more enthusiastically of late, particularly the longer end of the curve, that the Fed is going to be shifting its policy sooner rather than later. And at the, at the, very, ma at the very headline level, that's true. You know, you've continued to hear Fed speeches about moving away from the 75 basis point rate to the 50. But you're still talking about terminal rates that might be in, in the fives, um, A. And B, I do think that you're going to, you know, over most of my career, we've certainly seen nominal interest rates along the curve looking more like nominal GDP. So we still have long-end interest rates that are still relatively low against what I think most people would suggest nominal GDP might look like a year from now. Well, this is important, Jack. Are you basically saying that you don't buy this idea of uh, the trade into long bonds, which so many people are saying, not only as the consensus, but as the haven bet for next year? Well, I, I think it's a haven bet. And as we talked, well, we talked, you, you, this idea of being a little bit more balanced, I do think that it is a haven to look at longer duration fixed income, um, in particular because where we have seen a move in higher yields, you've actually seen most of that yield recovery and fixed income come in the form of discounts against par value. What that means is that bonds are going to remain very responsive. And we look at where volatility is, you know, fixed income volatility remains mag multiples higher than what you're seeing in equity market volatility. So I do think there is a case to be made for owning that long duration as a hedge. But I think it's really holding the role as having a hedge for investors who are looking to actually invest in the equity market, where they're going to get their actual longer term purchasing power protection. You know, finding dividends, growing dividends, and, and looking at the parts of the market that actually benefit from 
a gradual uh, a slowing of inflation and, and benefiting from some ongoing pricing power. So where is that? It's a barbell, if you will, yeah. a barbell or a balance. Where does that leave big tech? You know, big tech is, has been a source of so much in the way of big gains for the equity market for the past decade. But I do think when markets reset, and when they come out of recessions, ultimately you wind up finding new leadership um, in a world of possibly higher inflation than central banks might be comfortable with, but where they have to accept for political reasons. Uh, ultimately, big tech, either it shifts its attitude towards defending margins and possibly even starting to work consistently return cash, like in particular the semiconductor companies do, uh, to um, potentially just suffering a bit because so much of the future is a little bit less valuable in a higher interest rate world. So much of that earnings in the future become less valuable in a less certain world where, again, we have this premium about central banks' ability to forecast what the world looks like um, and the fact that you actually want to get some of that money back to decide where you reinvest it yourself not necessarily trusting uh, perhaps some of the technology founders who've reinvested so aggressively in their business with, in some cases, tremendous success and in some cases, somewhat more mixed results, as we're seeing in some particular parts of the market. Jack Caffrey, thank you so much. You'll be sticking with us. Uh, some headlines, meanwhile, dropping on the terminal. Here's Abigail Doolittle. Abby? Well, Lisa, yes, we did have some headlines uh, dropping on the terminal just a few minutes ago. The SEC to push bond and option brokers for better prices on trades. Now, a key part of uh, this looming uh, stock plan may also apply to fixed income. They basically, the SEC basically wants best execution uh, for all kinds of trades, more kinds of trades. Now, the big question here, Lisa, is this a nothing headline? Because it feels like the SEC is often pushing for more transparency a better execution uh, for those buying securities? Or is it going to be like 20 years ago when the FINRA put in place trace for bond trading? I was uh, at a couple different firms at that time, and it really made it more difficult for the traders because there really was more transparency for the clients. It's unclear right now, but the SEC right now is going to push bond and option brokers for better prices on trades. Thank you so much, Abby. Yeah, and that 15-minute window uh, potentially being curtailed to shorter for the requirement to report those bond prices. Coming up, US PMI numbers crossing any minute after data out of Europe, pointing to a recession, although with some hope for a shallow recession. That conversation coming up next. This is Bloomberg. research and a winning strategy to improve your firm's productivity and profitability bloomberg law combines the latest in ai powered tools and in-depth analysis to accelerate the research process to grow your practice and make better use of your valuable time the difference is bloomberg law So the inflation environment has been changing a little bit. Inflation's been very low for 25 years. Now people think inflation's coming back. How are you going to deal with that? I think many of the tools that we've historically used to battle inflation no longer work in the same ways they used to. I think people oftentimes thought of, of housing as a way, or, or especially retail and real estate as a way to, to um, hedge against inflation. Less and less possible the way we've invested in it. I think. Um, commodities similarly have been thought of as a way to hedge against inflation. There are challenges over the long term. Equities have been a hedge against inflation. Um, we will continue to do what we have done in the past, which is build a diversified portfolio where there are many different opportunities that have the, uh, the possibility of hedging against inflation because different types of inflation have to be hedged in different ways. So if it's a very quick increase of inflation as opposed to a slow rise of inflation, is it temporary? Is it a long and persistent type of inflation? So for us, 
I never model myself an economist that can predict where inflation is going. And so what I need to do is build a diversified portfolio where there are different options that can fight the different types of inflation and to pay close attention to it. And, and you know, fundamentally, it's done through the equity markets. Bloomberg has enhanced search on the terminal to deliver what you need when you need it. Now, you can simply type phrases in everyday English in the command line. Compare financials. Find people. Analyze markets. You can enter phrases or ask questions. What do you want to know today? Ask a question or visit SearchGo to find answers now. U.S. economic data crossing the terminal now. Abigail Doolittle has the details. Abby. Yeah, Lisa, this is really pretty interesting because we're looking at pretty sizable misses here. We're talking about the PMIs for uh, the U.S. manufacturing services and composite. We're looking at contraction for all three. Manufacturing came in at 47.6. The expectation was 50. That's below what the ISM manufacturing number came in, which I think it was around 49.2 for the last month. We have services in at 46.1. That's also interesting because a lot of folks thinking that if we're in a recession, it's not a real recession because services uh, holding up, and then the overall number, not surprisingly, coming in at 46.3. Now, also interesting, Lisa. Of course, we have stocks up a little bit on this, up two tenths of one percent. That idea of bad news is good news, but it's very interesting what you were talking about before. This deep, deep inversion for the yield curve. As you know, this usually portends a recession. Could it be the brief one that we have maybe seen, not seen? Maybe the case is growing for the idea that economic growth here is in fact slowing in the U.S. and that there could be some sort of a real recession ahead. But again, these PMIs in the U.S., uh, the preliminary numbers for the month of November missing across the board, coming in at uh, overall 46.3 contraction. Which is a contraction, exactly. Abigail Doolittle, thank you. And I do think it's notable, just to pick up on what you were talking about, Abby, that bad news uh, is good news for markets. You are seeing yields lower across the board, and you are seeing uh, just a sharp move lower uh, on the twos through the tens. And then again, the pop in stocks, because yes, once again, people are hopeful that perhaps this will give the Fed confidence to move away from some of their 75 basis point rate hikes and their hawkish tilt. To dig into the data in the U.S. and in Europe, here's our own Michael McKee. Mike. Well, Lisa, it uh, basically just tells the story of a global economic slowdown. The numbers we saw in the United States, pretty much the same as what we're seeing across Europe this morning. The biggest economies there, France and Germany, also seeing numbers in the 40s, although some slight improvement, not something that you're going to write home about, uh, but at least uh, France and Germany go up a little bit compared to the prior month. But they're still in the mid-40s for uh, not only manufacturing and services, but for the composite, the Eurozone in the the same situation. And the UK is kind of the surprise in the sense that those numbers look awful, but they're not as bad as had been forecast given the outlook for the British economy. So right now, it doesn't tell us much more than we already knew. Things are not good. The question is, where do we go from here? Michael McKee, thank you so much. JP Morgan's Jack Caffrey back with us. I am wondering whether we're already in a recession if we start to see some of this recessionary type of data. What's your view on that? Well, when we come back earlier this year, we wound up having two quarters officially of negative GDP. Um, underpinning that, though, is the sense that the consumer had remained strong. And I think that's certainly one of the issues that we have to try to take apart. How much is changing consumer behavior from jobs and their spending? How much is, to some extent, inventory adjustments working their way through the system? Either people are comfortable with their inventory levels or are actually seeing their backlogs beginning to fall. And as a result, they, the, those companies wind up cutting their own orders and, and working their way through the system, reflecting why those PMIs, particularly the manufacturing sector, have come in a little bit weaker. Now, that's not necessarily shocking um, overall. So I do think that the consumer remains reasonably resilient. And the question then is, is there some issue of where there is over leverage in the economy, you know, where you had a housing situation in 2004, 5, 6, 7, uh, or perhaps overinvestment in the communication sector in 99, 2000. We don't have those misalignments of capital, that uh, excess of borrowing, at least it would seem at the consumer and corporate levels, maybe the government level, but then again, governments influence our central banks. So more likely to be more political pressure on central banks to be somewhat accommodated. 
not answering your question, but I do think it's slowing. <laughs> uh, but, you know, there's a difference between the economists on one hand and the other, but let's keep watching the consumer because the consumer certainly is willing to engage and spend, and that really is a driver of 70% of the U.S. Is bad news good news for you, though? Does it give you any confidence to go out and dig into stocks at a time when the Fed is still tightening but might rethink the pace? Well, I think that comes back to where we started this conversation. Bad news is what's given particularly the fixed income markets and, and where we've seen some pops, the idea that the news is so bad that the Fed is, is going to recognize that they perhaps over tighten and can move us towards this discussion of an eventual easing. I can't really hear anyone talking about when the easing starts. So we haven't really gotten to the point where bad news has become truly good news that the Fed has recognized that they've overdone it again. Um, so with that, you know, bad news might make for uh, a less aggressive shift in the fixed income markets. Equity markets can look to that for some comfort. Um, and then ultimately we're going to come back and, you know, guidance is winding down and the sense of what corporate earnings start winding up looking like. You know, the first quarter, first and second quarters are likely to, to be driven by the sense of how much inventory is really out there and how much inventory do we need yeah. before we can actually flush that out and actually start seeing some real demand really reassert itself. One confusion uh, in 2022 heading into next year has been the energy sector because you have this decline that we've seen that's pretty dramatic in oil prices and the heels of potentially a slowdown in demand, a slowdown just in the global economy. And on the other hand, you're seeing that resilience. You're seeing the lack of investment in a lot of the companies that need to produce some of the goods, that need to produce oil, that need to produce copper. How much do you go into commodities now despite some of the speculation that we're going to see a decline in activity? Well, I, I think... There, there's an old adage among traders that high prices are the cure for high prices. Uh, and so, you know, that high prices results in consumers beginning to economize. I think that's certainly the fear you're seeing in energy isn't something you've seen necessarily in, in some of the other commodity markets yet. But those high prices are a function of underinvestment. Um, and I think that gets to the real intermediate term question, where you are seeing two very different responses. And I think it's a timely question to have coming after the COP27 discussion. Now you look at European energy stocks and they are cha changing themselves from being oil companies to power companies, investing very aggressively in terms of how they will generate and provide power on a going forward basis. In America, the attitude seems to be, I don't want to say the oil stocks are looking like tobacco stocks 20 or so years ago, when they recognized that they might not have the growth going forward that they've had in the past. They're going to generate a considerable amount of cash with a more disciplined spending profile and returning that cash to their investors and letting their investors decide whether they might find investing in solar is the right idea, investing in wind power or transmission systems, um, or just you know buying a completely different business. Or if you really believe in energy, you can buy more of the oil stocks along with the companies which are retiring their shares. So there, there is an a obvious split in energy. Clearly, we need it, you know, when it's 27 degrees in New York when we wake up on Monday morning yeah. and thinking, where did summer go? Indeed. Jack Caffrey, thank you. It seems like fall just didn't happen. For some of the pro sector price action this morning, let's get to Bloomberg's Abigail Doolittle. Abby. Well, Lisa, the volume may be 40% below the 20-day average, but we are looking at a gain now for the S&P 500 of four-tenths of 1%. Not surprisingly, most of the sectors are higher, of course, driven by those weaker PMIs, consumer discretionary technology and communication services up top. Over the last five days, though, Lisa, let's take a look at the contrast between uh, discretionary and staples. Staples risk off leading, discretionary is down. It's going to be interesting to see whether or not this reverses as we go into the year end and will we have a Santa Claus rally. Abby, thank you so much. Uh, coming up, the market moving events that you need to be watching. That's next in our trading diary. As Abby was saying, we are seeing a rally. Bad news evidently is good news, at least for now. This is Bloomberg.
activity in the fusion world than ever, and not just in government research labs. There's also an emerging private fusion industry that's attracted billions of dollars in capital in recent years. Governments and private investors alike realize that we've got to find a solution that's going to allow us to get to net zero targets. This is one of the hardest but most rewarding problems that, that humanity could work on. Ultimately, we all want the same thing. We want someone to put electricity on the grid from a fusion power station as quickly as possible. Frankly, the scale of the challenge, 3,000 gigawatts of fossil fuel to replace, um, there's not many things that can do that. In fact, there may only be fusion that can really do that. And while many in the scientific community predict fusion power will take decades, some in the private fusion space believe we'll get there in just a few years, as soon as the 2030s. market that over the past few weeks has made it clear it wants to go higher. It got a little spooked by the idea that geopolitical potentials are rising. I'm Lisa Robinson for Jonathan Farrow. We are seeing a lift to markets after disappointing PMIs. Bad news is good news. S&P up four tenths of a percent. NASDAQ up nearly three quarters of a percent. Yields are lower because perhaps people believe the Fed will be able to move away from some of their rate hikes. Time now for the Trading Diary. We need to be watching Umesh consumer sentiment coming at the top of the hour. New home sales continues the host of data today. Fed minutes out at 2 p.m. U.S. markets closing for the Thanksgiving holiday on Thursday and a shorter market day on Friday. Uh, happy Thanksgiving to everyone who does celebrate. I hope you enjoy it with your families, with your loved ones. This was Countdown to the Open. This is Bloomberg. manufacturing and consumption of these fuel products in the illegal refineries. Oil theft, known as bunkering, and the refining of its spoils is worsening the damage from decades of fossil fuel exploitation, creating one of the world's most severe ecological disasters. Our sacred forests, our homes, have to give way to oil wells. And no one gets much benefit. Imagine a resident of Portacot who inhales this suit every second in 24 hours, seven days a week, 30 days in the month, and for years now, we are dying slowly but surely, and our lifespan is reducing every day. I don't have any investors. All this is all money in. This is me just building it. It's pretty much full service shadow banking with nobody in charge.
This is Bloomberg Daybreak with Lee. I'm Bloomberg Radio. Welcome to Daybreak Australia. This is Count Under the Close. Welcome to Bloomberg Crypto. Pepsi's number fever campaign in the Philippines has probably gone down in history as one of the biggest marketing disasters in history, mainly because of a human error that led Pepsi to print more winning caps than they planned. The resulting chaos caused riots, civil unrest, and even deaths. Reporting this story took over a year and it resulted in me flying uh, to Manila in the Philippines to meet unlucky winners and to find out exactly what happened back then in the 1990s. My name is Jeff Maish. I'm a journalist based in Los Angeles. I wrote the story for Bloomberg Business Week about Pepsi's number fever campaign. The Philippines is a really interesting country. It's made up of thousands of islands. And it's also a country that's very heavily influenced by America. American culture is everywhere you look in the Philippines. They're obsessed with Frank Sinatra music, for example. They love all things America, and that extends to their, their love for soft drinks, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola. In the 1990s, it was everywhere. Pepsi and Coca-Cola were embroiled in what is now known as the Cola Wars. It was a fierce battle for market dominance. Number Fever was already a really popular promotion. It had been rolled out in America to great success. And so Pepsi decided to roll it out internationally, particularly in Asia. They thought it was the answer to their problems. They thought it could finally help them beat their biggest competitor. A million pesos, or $68,000, doesn't sound like a lot now. But in 1992, that was a phenomenal amount of money. You've got to remember that in the Philippines at the time, the average monthly income was about $100. So a million pesos was wealth beyond anyone's wildest imaginations. Number Fever caught fire in the Philippines. Kids were saving up their pocket money to buy a bottle of Pepsi. Parents were squirreling away all of the bottle caps in bags. You would walk down the street and people were going through trash trying to find discarded bottle caps. It was a national phenomenon. Pepsi boasted that half the population of the Philippines was playing it. Number Fever boosted Pepsi's sales every month from $10 million to $14 million. It had a huge impact on Pepsi's bottom line. Number Fever quickly became Number Hysteria. Maids were being jailed for stealing their employers winning bottle caps. There was even some murders uh, over, over winning bottle caps. People were fighting in the streets uh, over these caps. There were signs that there were going to be problems with Number Fever very early. Pepsi had rolled out the competition in Chile and a garbled fax had caused some kind of problem with the winning number. They'd announced the wrong one in Chile, causing riots. There were signs that there could be big problems ahead if they didn't keep their eye on the ball. So in 1992, Pepsi decided to extend the campaign in the Philippines, and they announced that the competition would go on for a few more weeks. One night, on the television news, they announced the latest winning number, 349. The problem was, 349 had already been allocated as a non-winning number in earlier campaigns. So there were literally hundreds of thousands of bottle caps with 349 just floating around the Philippines. Hundreds of thousands of people all across the Philippines, thousands of islands, were finding winning bottle caps. 349, 349. Some people had 10 lucky 349 bottle caps. People were dancing in the street, celebrating. They thought their problems were over. They were millionaires. 
it's still not certain exactly how many winners there were of lucky 349 bottle caps, but we know that Pepsi printed over 600,000 of them. Pepsi realized very early that there was a problem. Hundreds of people started arriving at their bottling plants with their lucky bottle caps. They realized something was seriously wrong. Pepsi tried to solve the problem by offering a small token donation to anyone that brought a lucky bottle cap to their bottling plant. But it wasn't enough. People didn't want just a handful of pesos. People wanted their million peso prize. Within a year, violent protests and riots outside Pepsi factories would leave dozens injured and five people dead. At one Pepsi factory in the Philippines, a grenade was thrown through the window. It killed three Pepsi employees. Anacita Rosario was a school teacher living near Manila in the Philippines. She was one of the tragic victims of this whole thing. She was walking to a nearby store to buy some rice one day when a Molotov cocktail was thrown at a Pepsi truck in a, in a violent protest. It bounced under the truck and exploded. It killed her and an innocent bystander who was just a child and injured many others. When I was in the Philippines, I tracked down Anacita's daughter, Cindy, and her husband, Raul. It was clear to me that they were still very upset by the whole thing. You know, a family had been ripped apart by this competition. And Raul told me that he'd never remarried. He'd uh, told me that he'd gone to meet Pepsi executives after his wife was killed. And he was angry. He, he said to them, you know, this wouldn't have happened if it wasn't for you, if it wasn't for Number Fever. The biggest revelation from my reporting was rumors that Pepsi was somehow involved in bombing their own trucks. I found a newspaper report with a headline that said, Pepsi goons bomb their own trucks. And when I visited the MBI, the police uh, department in, in the Philippines, they presented me with documents and interviews with people who claimed that Pepsi had paid them to cause riots and to cause trouble outside their plants in order to destabilize the situation and to frame the owners of the coalitions uh, that, were, that were fighting them to try and curry favor. I just thought that was, that was so shocking. And of course, Pepsi denied it, but how bizarre that a company would be accused of bombing their own trucks. The contest had sparked so much anger in the Philippines because it landed at just this really weird time in the Philippines' history. It was during a crazy election that was racked with allegations of fraud. The Philippines was in a kind of love-hate relationship with America. They loved, obviously, the American aid and finances that was pouring into the country, but at the same time, they yearned for independence. They wanted to be their own country. Vicente Del Fierro was a local preacher living in Manila, and he hated the Number Fever campaign. Del Fierro thought Pepsi's Number Fever campaign was just one of the many ways that America was asserting its dominance over a third world country. He hated seeing his fellow countrymen get ripped off, in his eyes, by this huge multinational American company. He wanted justice. Del Fierro rounded up over 800 winners of 349 bottle caps, and he got them all together to sue Pepsi for over $400 million to be divided between those holders of lucky bottle caps. Del Fierro took money from some of the people who could afford it. They paid him 500 pesos to help with legal fees, but for people who couldn't afford the, the money, he would just represent them pro bono. Well, I am prepared is to build the pressure on Pepsi and so you see people uh, marching in the streets. Mm -hmm. So um, we had mounted our own uh, campaign even in the U.S. Even in the U.S. He flew to America and he hired two 
uh, consumer lawyers uh, here in America to take on Pepsi. He had a meeting at Pepsi's headquarters to try and resolve the problem. But he said he wanted to take it all the way to the highest courts in America. When those cases were heard in America, those courts decided that this was a problem that should be heard in the Philippines, not in America. Back in the Philippines, Del Fierro continued his case in the Filipino courts. At one stage, there were arrest warrants handed out for nine Pepsi-Cola executives, which he saw as a big victory. We don't know if those arrest warrants were ever upheld, but it made newspaper headlines across the country. Pepsi did not take kindly to Del Fierro's campaign. They tried everything to shut him down. They sued him for libel. My father had to attend three times a month for a branch 145, and another hearing for the branch 138, also three times a month. Also, um, there was a time uh, my father was hospital due to heart failure. Still, he had to attend the two branch hearing otherwise. Uh, for not attending, the judge will issue a warrant of arrest to my father. Uh, my father uh, passed away January 13, 2010, after staying for almost one year in a hospital. He died of complications due to heart failure. After the death of my father, I was inspired to do the website. PepsiCo will be remembered for what they did to the consumer in the Philippines and to my father. When I reached out to Pepsi for comment for this story, they claimed that they didn't have access to anyone who was working at Pepsi that was around in those days. They also said that during COVID-19, they didn't have access to their, their documents about this, but you know, they were, very, they were very careful to say that they were sorry for everything that happened. And we do know that Pepsi did try everything to try and make this right. The Pepsi number fever disaster cost the company millions. We know that they paid up to $10 million in those goodwill payments. But the financial effect could be much greater. After the disaster, we know that Pepsi sales dipped. They were overtaken by Coca-Cola again. Pepsi's number fever disaster changed the legacy of that soft drink in the Philippines forever. Some people of a certain age won't touch it. For many people, Pepsi is a taboo word. A lot of the people that I spoke to were still quite traumatized by their experience, by that experience of winning a million pesos, losing it, and then returning to their normal life in poverty in Manila. When the news of the bombing came out, it was a massive story in Germany. We are following some breaking news coming to us out of Dortmund in Germany. It was covered by all the media outlets. Three roadside explosions triggered at the same time last night as a coach left its hotel in the south of Dortmund. Public figures.